Hello and welcome to the 11th episode of Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality, The Shadow of God, Suleiman the Magnificent. Very lucky to be joined by Columba. Hello, recovered after last week. Yes, once again, the forces of darkness are trying to assail me, but I have recovered, ready to go. And our wonderful Turkophile Semiagog. <laughs> yes, uh, <clears throat> very happy to be with you both. Absolutely wonderful. Um, Marcus should turn up. Uh, sadly, we, we've had to delay because we're waiting a little bit for, um, yes, for some internet um, connection issues. Yes, the forces of nature are, are proving to be a difficulty. Oh dear. All the forces of God are arrayed against us in this stream. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I thought a, a good place to start would be actually introducing um, uh, Suleiman's father, Selim, because as uh, we're going to demonstrate, uh, Suleiman's reign was very much based upon the um, uh, major achievements of his um, immediate predecessor. Um, Semigog, is there anything you want to um, introduce us, you know, a, a topic to introduce us regarding um, Selim Yabus? Well, um, uh, just in general terms, uh, his father was, of course, uh, Bayezid, um, I believe the second Bayezid, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And uh, he was a ruler known for being uh, somewhat restrained. I think one of his epithets is the law abiding, which sort of sets him apart from the, 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 the aggressive stance taken by his immediate predecessors. Uh, most notably uh, Mehmet the Conqueror. Um, he had a number of children. Among them was uh, Selim, who later came to be known as Yavu Selim, the Grim. Uh, Selim was not, however, um, uh, expected to, in the early days, expected to become the next Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And he was sent off uh, to, I think it was Trabzon, but uh, certainly it was a part of the Ottoman Empire that was distant from the capital, and uh, that was doubtless intentional. Uh, interestingly enough, though, it put him in the immediate region of the Caucasus, where he would have dealt with the um, warriors of that region who were uh, quite formidable at the time. At any rate, he uh, ended up um, making... Uh, a play for the support of the Janissaries. I'm not sure how far you want me to go with this, since I expect you'll cover much of this. Um, can I just and, um, can I just ask a quick question? And I'm sure you guys covered some of this last time. But um, in, in terms of this, uh, the Ottoman succession was there a sort of uh, among the princes was there one who was designated as the successor, and was no. it just sort of the choice of the Sultan, or no? Um, it, I mean, what we're going to be discussing regarding Suleiman Magn Magnificent is the trial you know the tribulations regarding succession but during the first 200 years of the ottoman empire um primogeniture was never an established principle and even if the sultan favored one son over the others that wouldn't be a guarantee of success so for example um with selim uh the son who was meant to succeed and was favored by his father bayezid was ahmed um but ahmed um fought selim in a three-year civil war in which Selim ultimately won against both his brother and his father, deposing his father and becoming Sultan. So what we see in the first sort of 200 years of Ottoman history is what could be basically described as fratricidal conflict. Um, one brother triumphs over the others and then murders all the other brothers. Uh, we see it with um, Bayezid and Chem also. And not only um, not only the brothers, but any sons that the brothers have as well. Yes, yes, their yeah. entire yes, lines. Nephews. Charming, yes. charming, excellent. Yes, and the, it was often through the ritual act of strangulation with a, uh, a bowstring. And it was a situation considerably complicated by the fact that it was more or less traditional for the concubines of the sultan who produced a male heir to cease relations with him at that point and become sort of the mother of one of the sultan's children, which in an arrangement that involves any number of women who have produced sons vying um, to become the mother of the next sultan, you know, you can imagine that it created its own species of uh, intrigue at the court. And additionally, <laughs> yeah. the, the different um, power blocks within the empire that had certain expectations, for example, the Janissaries who uh, enjoyed the material fruits of conquest, um, you know, if, for example, it looked as though an upcoming uh, sultan was not going to 
sort of unleash them and allow them to do what they uh, do and to bring home booty and the rest, they would uh, withdraw their their support uh, from mm-hmm. whomever that was. And in this case, what happened was Selim uh, pursued um, the support of the Janissaries. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a further mess when uh, Ahmed, who, as AM has pointed out, had you know sort of been the heir apparent, though in no formal sense, um, he apparently took up with the uh, Kuzelbash, which I expect um, AM is going to say something about uh, when we turn to uh, interactions with the the Safavids. But the, mm-hmm. the basic thing to understand is that Selim had not at first been expected to be the sultan. He uh, quite cleverly um, engaged in getting the support that he needed, and Ahmed uh, played into his hands in some respects. Bayezid II, uh, again, if I'm remembering that right, was not uh, as aggressive a, f- a figure as someone like Mehmet the Conqueror. And in the end, uh, Selim took power uh, fairly quickly um, and dealt with the dust-ups with uh, those of his brothers that had not been killed. Um, and uh, in the course of doing so, ended up killing all of them as well as uh, any number of uh, of nephews. It's interesting because the way you put it, um, it's as if, because I had I'd always assumed that it was just... Um... A very chaotic it's just what happens no one thought about it but it's almost as if this fratricide is like institutional especially with the bowstring which sort of conjures up to me sort of older nomadic traditions from when the turks were still sort of wandering into the anatolia you know there, there's something to it it's very interesting yeah just and i'd say that this- Sorry, Semyagog. I'm um, just to buttress um, the point you made, Semyagog, regarding the um, the mother of the Sultan. It was also expected that um, among you know the various sort of women in the harem, of course, the harem was a um, a great source of intrigue. Um, that once a concubine of the Sultan had produced a son, um, it was therefore basically you know assumed that the woman couldn't sleep with the Sultan anymore. So in that way, you do have a sense of institutionalized um, friction because every son produced by the Sultan has his own advocate in the form of his own mother. So you have all of these mothers of the would-be Sultans competing over and basically angling for the um, you know intrigue on behalf of their children at the same time. So yes, this was um, expected and this really doesn't sort of um, begin to unravel until we have the reign of um, Mehmet III and um, his son Ahmed after which point you have you know the golden cage you know basically sultans or or would-be sultans are expected to stay within the harem until they reach um, maturity and the whole emphasis of fratricidal conflict or even gaining experience um, before becoming sultan is basically you know brushed aside. And with uh, with, uh, Columba's uh, question about how it you know whether or not this was institutionalized and in, intentional in order to yield, at least in theory, the best of the, the or, or the most successful. You know, uh, uh, in the face of this trial of the Sultan's sons, uh, there's certainly an argument to be made for it. Though it failed utterly, as we'll soon see, I think, in the case of Suleiman mm-hmm. the Magnificent's um, uh, uh, successor. But uh, to that point, I think it was Mehmet the Conqueror, Columba, who uh, actually took what was fully accepted tradition of fratricide and actually enshrined it uh, in Ottoman law. So not only was it accepted, it was actually, you know, made its way into the law books uh, that the, the the killing of the sultan's uh, relatives who might present a, a, a contest in terms of taking um, the seat's power, uh, it was enshrined. So, I mean, that certainly seems... Uh, how do I say this? I'm, I'm not sure how much more institutionalized it could get once yeah. it makes it into law. <laughs> It certainly does sound like something Mehmed would do as well. <laughs> so upon um, Selim um, a- achieving power in Constantinople, um, he is now faced with two major rivals. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, there were two major Sunni powers in um, in the Muslim world. Um, Sunni, of course, being the branch of Islam to which the Ottomans but were uh, to which the Ottomans belonged. Um, which was, of course, the Mamluk Sultanate in the south, which controlled the holy cities of um, Mecca and Medina, in addition to other major cities in Islam, such as Damascus, the old capital of the um, Umayyads, and uh, Cairo, the old capital of the Fatimids, and the Ayyubids, the state of Suleiman. However, in the east, we see the uh, emergence of a new power, and um, Semyagog was introducing us to the uh, the Kizilbash, or the, um, the red-headed Turkomans. Um, the Turkomans in the east, uh, basically you had the, um, we've talked about Tamerlane uh, quite extensively on previous streams. Um, Tamerlane establishes a very violent uh, 
regime which lasts essentially throughout the the entirety of his lifetime after he dies in 1405 the timurid empire begins to collapse um as a result of you know rivalries between his son and grandson and the frontiers of the timurid empire recede further and further into what we now what we what was then called Transoxania, but will roughly correspond to um, modern Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan. In the um, West, the lands of you know Iraq, Western um, Western Iran, uh, the Caucasus in the South, uh, were controlled by various Turkmen tribes. Um, during the reign of Bayezid and Mehmed II, um, one of these uh, Turkmen tribes, uh, Uzan Hasan, who had formed an alliance with the the last rulers of Trebizond, the uh, the common lawyer Trebizond, um, had established a you know a, a sweeping sort of um, dominion which um, you know rivaled that of the Sasanians. However, when Uzun Hasan died, that empire you know, collapsed very quickly. And in 1500, a um, descendant of a Sufi religious order in um, Ardabil, which is east of Tabriz, um, uh, Ismail Safafid. Um, with the help of these um, Kizilbash, these Turkmen, um, marches into the regional power center of Tabriz and establishes a Safavid dynasty. And over the next 10 years, um, he establishes you know, quite a sizable empire in rapid succession. Uh, he's able to conquer Iraq, he's able to establish hegemony over the Caucasus, and he's able to push back the new power in the um, Transoxania, the uh, Shaibinids, and um, push the borders of Iran into uh, the Khorasan region. But more significantly, perhaps, than all of that, the fact that he is a, um, a great conqueror in the first, and a very young conqueror, he becomes Shah at the age of 15, and by the age of um, 25, he has established an empire in Iran, is that he um, chooses to import um, uh, 12 Islam, essentially from Lebanon, and establish um, Iran and that's, as um, a... That, that, that's Shia. Yes, as Islam. a 12 uh, Shia state, um, again, in religious competition with the Ottomans and with the Mamelukes. So and, and in addition to that, of course, he assumes the mantle of Shah and Shah, king of kings, this idea that he is the successor of the House of Sasan and the Achaemenids before them. So he's trying to revive a sense of um, Iranian nationhood, yet at the same time, he's adopting a form of Islam, which is in contention uh, with the Sunni principalities in the West. And so, you know, when Selim becomes Sultan in 1512, uh, he is faced with this um, major new power in the East, this um, revitalized Persian empire. And it's also the case that um, um, Ahmed, his, his competitor in the succession, Ahmed's son flees to the Safavids, if I'm not mistaken. And so there's and that, um, yeah. It, Ahmed himself, uh, once it become clear that it, it, there's going to be an open conflict between uh, him and Selim at some point, uh, Ahmed, as I understand it, actually um, contrives to seek the support of the Kuzilbash and so makes of himself uh, something of a heretic. It's important to note that the Ottomans had a certain amount of tolerance for Sufism, um, as as is reflected in a, an anecdote about a uh, Selim, when he marches south and passes through Damascus in terms of a famous uh, Sufi saint, perhaps we'll have time to talk about it. But what's important uh, to understand here is that while the Ottomans did have a certain amount of tolerance for Sunni Sufism, uh, they could they could afford none, obviously, for uh, uh, the Shiite dimensions of it, because the main distinction between the Sunnis and the Shiites is that the, the Sunnis basically, uh, and to, to simplify it to the maximum degree, the Sunnis believed that following the first four of the rightly guided caliphs, that the uh, control of the community should descend upon uh, caliphs who were selected by the ummah, not necessarily in dem democratic process, but you had the basic idea that the community chose the leaders in some respect. Whereas uh, the, with rightly, the, the rightly guided, that's the first caliphate the Rashidun, or the second caliphate, rather. It's the first four of the them. First. It ends with with Ali, who is killed, um, and those are the, the those first four are recognized by uh, all these branches, um, and then it begins to divide and become quite uh, uh, complex uh, following that point. But the 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 basic idea is that the Shiites have a more Persian idea of it in terms of a holy bloodline, and so the leadership of the community must come from uh, a line of blood descent from Ali, and they believe that because, of course, Ali was 
was married to Muhammad's uh, daughter Fatima. And so the idea is that there is the actual blood of the prophet in the leadership. And so that was a very different arrangement with the Shiites. The last thing to point out is that though the Kuzilbash were uh, Twelvers in some respect, that number 12, um, uh, similar to, for example, the Seveners, the Ismailis, or the uh, the Fivers. Um, each of those terms refers to um, the, which Imams they recognize. It gets into all the Byzantine, well, I guess I shouldn't use that adjective here. It gets into all the complex stuff of the Shiite uh, succession. The point, though, is that when, when uh, Ismail was uh, first coming to power, the version of Twelverism that he first um, uh, uh, played with and asserted was uh, heterodox even for Shiites. It wasn't even a fully accepted uh, Twelver variant. And as things progressed later, he was forced to temper that and bring in um, more straightforward uh, Twelver figures later. And I suppose, because um, you mentioned that um, Salim very cleverly had, uh, had, had you know, went to the Janissaries and secured the major basis of power in, in, in trying to get to the throne, I suppose, um, with him doing that so successfully, um, Ahmed would have been forced to um, turn to the Safavids or turn to another power to to attempt to regain the throne. Yes, and when he did so, he uh, alienated the Janissaries so thoroughly that it had a sort of a knock-on effect in terms of the legitimacy of Ahmed's own father, Bayezid II, which would bring us around to uh, Selim uh, removing him from power, which I suspect AM was going to turn to next. Yes, essentially... What we're um, both of you have basically elucidated is transforming this into a religious conflict, essentially about the position of Islam and the Ottoman state. And Salim uses this, and uh, upon the assumption, assumption of um, uh, you know the girding of Salim, um, he then turns to you know how to deal with the Shia orientated um, Kizilbash in Anatolia, because as the Ottomans are expanding further east, especially around the uh, the Sivas region. Um, they are going to, they're approaching and basically absorbing more Shia who are, again, have this, um, this idea of, you know, loyalty perhaps to the um, Safavid monarchy um, as, again, part of this contentious legitimacy which the Ottomans are trying to impose in eastern Anatolia. And this, the, a form of this takes place in the form of uh, the uh, Sakulu rebellion which um, Salim puts down uh, very harshly as, again, as a prelude to this conflict. And Ismail sort of meekly um, supports the uh, the rebellion, um, not, you know, to, to a great extent, but nevertheless, um, this is a justification, a pretext for um, eventual conflict between the Ottomans and, is and this, the Sufferfords. Um, and is this a, um, because I, when reading about this, I saw that um, in dealing with um, um, these sorts of Shiite, um, um, risings that were fostered by the Safavids, he conducted a sort of census of um, all all men, um, all Shiites from the age of, uh, I think, seven to seven. Yes, and, and had them murdered. Yes, uh, um, yes. Per um, Islamic law at the time, you couldn't kill people um, younger at the age of eight. And of course, there is a, a Turkic um, Mongol equivalent whereby you have. Um, a wheel, essentially a wheel of a um, a, a, a girl or a cart, and if the man is um, taller than the wheel, then he could be executed. But yes, um, all um, Shia over a certain age in that particular region, I believe this was an Amesia and uh, Sivas, were um, put to the put to the sword, essentially killed. Yeah, that's and an interesting has... rule with the wheel. It's like manlet supremacy amongst the Mongols. You know, if you're if you're too short, you can get off, get away with anything. <laughs> And it has uh, some interesting echoes of uh, Mithridates Eupator, Miso Romaeus, you know, in Anatolia as well, slaughtering so many Romans, though. Yes, uh, more, yes, I imagine. Many I cases of such things in Anatolia, Vespers and what have you. Yeah, and I think the uh, the number, tell me if I'm wrong, Am, it's something, they assume something like 40,000 were killed in that way. Yes, I think so. Um, it's a complete massacre. I also think there's a um, an, another significant element to this. Uh, regarding uh, where Selim was brought up, I think it's important to know that he was um, born in Amasya. He was um, a, a, he was sort of brought up in this region. His mother had been, a, uh, I believe, a, a Dolkadir princess. The Dolkadir um, uh, Turkish principality was around this region again. So um, he has a, a long history with this region. And I think, again, talking, you know, from a, a a purely military uh, perspective. Once you 
align yourself with a foreign power and you're basing it upon, you know, a sectarian issue such as Shia Islam, um, you have basically signaled yourselves as potential traitors in the event of a conflict. And so you could argue that Salim is just um, brutally ensuring loyalty on behalf of his own partisans before the inevitable conflict, which um, which gets us to um, to Chaldaran. Um, uh, Semigog, would you like to um, elucidate about the uh, the Battle of Chaldaran? All I know about it, I'm uh, afraid, is that uh, Selim mustered his troops and met with the uh, Safavids and uh, crushed them. Um, and that the Safavids at this point, though they had had about a decade of uh, success in consolidating their own um, domains, uh, were not at this point quite as powerful as they eventually uh, came to be. Though uh, it, it is worth noting that they uh, were strong enough at that time to have uh, dealt pretty uh, neatly with any number of uh, Timurids uh, mm -hmm. with, with whom they had uh, clashed. In terms of the makeup of their military at this point, uh, it was uh, largely made up of these uh, Kuzulbash Turkoman warriors who came from uh, the eastern, uh, northeastern regions uh, in many respects of, uh, of Anatolia. And presumably uh, quite um, cavalry heavy, I would assume. Yes. Um, and, and one would imagine that a certain proportion of them would be similar to what we saw with, for example, you know, the cataphracts of the Phrygians and the rest, the heavily armored uh, cavalry. You would expect to see uh, archers, you know, um, represented mm -hmm. uh, strongly. The Ottomans at this point, though, uh, did have uh, not only artillery, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, firearms as well. Yes, but it's not only um it's not only firearms. I, I would I would argue even more strongly. Um, it's one area that I that I perhaps can talk about a little bit because, of course, you know even at this time the Janissaries and um and the military organization of the Turks is allowing them to win many battles. And and you see this very often that um the forces that they're against, be it the forces of the West or the East, you'll have these more traditional formations with archers and cavalry. Um, and the Turks just absolutely stomp them with the Janissaries, and and the Janissaries, um, you know, we, we we've talked about how um, it's only once you get to Charles the Seventh in France um, that you have a sort of professional artillery corps and you have um, professional craftsmen um, building and maintaining these weapons. Um, there are Turkish records which attest to um, an even more advanced system where you have um, um, you know discrete manufacturers um, for 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 um, arquebuses and muskets and cannon and then the really large cannons as well um and in the 1390s you know around 1400 they already had this organizational capability and then if you consider the janissaries as well who are essentially you know a sort of real life sardaukar for anyone who's seen you know the recent dune film um you know these were um boys taken through the dev sherma system the blood tax system so they'd be Christian boys, um, ideally without any sort of craft. Um, that that was a rule, you know. If they were a blacksmith boy, or they had any sort of independent mind um, or any independent craft, they weren't accepted. They wanted boys who would be totally independent and could be totally indoctrinated. And that's what you see in the early Janissary period before they begin to degenerate and go a bit Praetorian. They they have this fanatical loyalty, and they will be thrown into the most ludicrously dangerous situations you know they're the first ones through the wall at constantinople they brave hails of fire and they just do these things again and again um, um and break all opposition you combine that fanaticism with um, with, um unrivaled military technology then you know it's it's a, it's a solid recipe for success Yes, and they were a, a standing army, which most nations at that time did not have, which is why they played such a central role in any question of succession, because they were immediately available to do what whatever it was that was uh, necessary or whatever it was that they uh, saw as in, in their own best interest. In the case of Chaldaran, um, they were definitely um, in a great position with their use of artillery, but uh, I believe as well they adopted some tactics, um, uh, probably from the Hussites, 
in terms of using wagon rings. And they took a uh, cover behind them, which would, of course, blunt the effectiveness of any kind of cavalry charging this improvised uh, fortification. And just as a last point to your uh, the, the thing you noted about the... Um, the specialization uh, among the Ottomans. Yes, there's a, a place that still survives today in Istanbul called the Topane. Top meaning uh, cannonball or just ball more generally, but it came to refer to cannonballs. And so the Topane was where uh, the artillery was manufactured. And in their region um, during this period, the Ottomans were uh, preeminent with the, uh, the use of gunpowder weapons. Wonderful. I just um, want to um, quickly say that, um, yes, Marcus is here. Uh, hopefully, we're, hopefully, um, we're not going to have too many problems regarding internet connection, Marcus. But um, very uh, indeed. Um, firstly, just to my lovely co-host and our guest, uh, Semigog, hello, and to the uh, to everyone watching, hello. Also, I apologise for my enforced absence, but I've um, <laughs> I'm just uh, through a massive thunderstorm, so hence everyone being patient enough to wait for me. I appreciate it very much. Um, just on the point on the Janus series, just to get into the meat and potatoes of this discussion, I did want to mention. There's something interesting about the Jenner series that is worth mentioning um, because I just caught the bit where Columbus was saying how they were initially quite fanatical and then degenerated very quickly. There's something about the, the Jenner series, or uh, semi-god, correct me on my pronunciation if I get it wrong, Yedishedi, um troops that in the beginning of their life, um, sort of around the time uh, just prior to the capture of Constantinople, you could say from the early, early 1400s, uh, the Yenisheri are very proficient archers. They're also very proficient in the use of um, sort of like uh, almost a Turkish equivalent of a halberd um, and also with, you know, swords and, and spears and whatever. In this respect, they almost resemble the Varangians who we sort of imagine these sort of Saxon and Viking Varangians as being axe wielders. But also if you look at the Byzantine manuals, they are also proficient archers. They're proficient horsemen. They can use swords and spears. And the Yenisheri are very much like this. Um, by the time we arrive sort of towards the end of the 1400s and into the 1500s, they have themselves become proficient in the use of firearms. They're probably one of the first bodies of, um, as Semigog said, uh, being uh, standing troops rather than because they're a bodyguard unit rather than being levies. They are they, they become one of amongst the first uh, troops in the European theatre to, to be proficient in the use of firearms. They still use the shock troops and... Uh, like Columba had said as well, um, they are almost fanatical. And if you look at the way they conduct themselves, for example, um, well, we even saw it to some degree against the Timurids at Ankara um, prior to the fall of Constantinople, but how they're used at Rhodes, how they're used at uh, Mohawks, how they're used at um, even Malta to some degree, and a whole number of other, other battles, like Custom the War War, um, you can list them off. The Janisheri are in the thick of it and they're around the Sultan. They guard the Sultan when he's at the battlefield. They guard him with his life. And, and they have very to remember true. that um, they're slaves as well. And so they are trained mm. and used in a way that would be unthinkable for a free man. They are used mm. and abused in the worst ways. Exactly, and this also makes them very hard. Certainly in the, in the beginnings of the first sort of 150 years of their life as a unit, uh, they're very hard. Um, and, uh, hardened and, and tough and uh, resolute. Um, but then, like you accurately say, Columba, there's a period from maybe, you could probably say from the second siege of Vienna onwards, they just start to generate to the point where they morph from being these Turkish Varangians to being Turkish Praetorians. Yes, um, and, and their battlefield it. quality um, reflects that. Uh yeah, I was just going to say that you can you can even track it in some of the sort of documentation, you know, because um this is one area that I know because I, I remember um writing an essay on this and you you begin to see around that period um after the second siege, mm. um, especially into the 1600s, it really picks up. Mm. You even see cases of um Christian families and in some cases Muslim families requesting their, their children to be to be to be joined to the Janissaries because yeah. it's no longer just this sort of suicide squad. Now it's um, there are these sort of Praetorian um, chances for advancement, and you even see cases of. There's um, a social status of, uh, about it, in a sense. Yes, you see, you see cases of Janissaries being billeted as well in um in sort of towns, many towns in the Balkans, mm. and there they enjoy a sort of you know local local high status, and so mm. you see many of these things happening, but they also become um extremely degenerate, especially in yeah. their um in their, well, once, in their bedtime activities. Yeah. To, to well, once way. they well once they uh, uh, once they attain a, a certain degree of civil power in the in the 
Ottoman Empire, that's when that degeneracy started. They sort of become almost power plays in some of the Sanjaks where the Turks become um, not, not really majorities in any part of the European portion of the empire, but certainly where they form large minorities or, or large proportions of the population. Uh, when it, wherever the, the Janissaries are uh, sort of integrate into the civilian power structure, they do um, intermingle with that, those sort of levels of power and sort of start to gen degenerate, like you say. And of the course, other... you also have um, the Aga of the Janissaries as well, who mm. becomes a person of extreme importance. Mm. And exactly. They're, they're... And they're an organization, uh, uh, they have a religious dimension to them, which is the Bektashi order, which mm -hmm. is its own sort of way that they were, that they were, um, how shall I say this, uh, separated and in some respects became uh, problematic because they owed allegiance over time. They came to owe allegiance in certain ways uh, to, 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 to ideas or, 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 um, leaders, uh, beyond just the Sultan. And in fact, they caused so many problems that in time, you know, eventually Mahmoud the second, um, had them all killed, uh, when he did his major military reforms, introducing Western stuff. That's sometime later. The last thing to point out is that of course, the idea of bringing in these slave troops and having them be elite, uh, was not in any respect uh, new. You had uh, Selim, who was stationed near the Caucasus, who was dealing with the Circassians and others who formed slave elite troops. And many of those troops were sent to the Mamluks, which mm -hmm. uh, no doubt we're going to be discussing shortly. So lots of people were doing this sort of thing. Yes, it's a wonderful. Um, sorry, it's a wonderful segue. We really have to move on. Sadly, um, oh, can I just end my point? I was just my last sentence. I am. I was going to say is, if you look at the Janissaries, they sort of basically are a combination of Persian immortal, um, Byzantine Varangians, Roman Praetorians, and it's funny that it happens around Istanbul because this place is the nexus of those three cultures almost coming together at the same place. I just want to make that reflection because it's just interesting that the Janissaries Yen are, are expressed in that way. Sorry, go on, Apostolic. I know, sure. Just to quickly summarize what the effects of Chaldeland were. Um, essentially, you know, Tibris was occupied. Um, the sort of messianic mystique around uh, Ismail himself was sort of broken, and he actually spent the last sort of 10 years of his reign a delinquent drunkard. And this sort of focuses on to the inevitable conflict with the Mamluks, and as Semigog says, uh, regarding the Circassians in particular. Um, the Circassians occupied a, a very prestigious role in the uh, the Burji dynasty um, in the Mamluk Sultanate. Basically, these are the uh, Turkified sort of slave remnants who um, essentially captured a state after the collapse of um, uh, the dynasty of Salah al-Din in the 13th century. And thereafter, the Mamluks made a name for themselves in driving out and defending uh, the Levant from the Mongol conquest, representing the terminus of their campaign, and that the Ilkhanate wouldn't push any further. Um, however, by this point, um, I think it's again important to mention this um, conflict regarding, you know, the the soul, you know, the the, su the supreme sort of state within Islam. Um, the Mamluks were hoping that the Ottoman Safavid War would last a very long time, as they, in terms of like the relative position of power, would you know, gain serious advantage from that. But the ultimate effect of the um, original Safavid war was that Salim won a very short victory, um, demoralized the Safavid ruler, was able to take over, you know, Ezerum and various parts in Eastern Anatolia and establish himself in Northern Mesopotamia as well, because of course the traditional boundaries of um, the old Iranian state of you know, the Sasanian empire were the Euphrates um, around cities, you know, former cities such as um, Amida, uh, which are now sort of a, a Diyarbakir. And um, from this point, you know, the, the, the Mamluks, of course, had, um, uh, there was the, were basically positing, you know, a potential alliance with Ismail after this. And of course, various um, Safavid envoys went through Mamluk territory in order to interact with, you know, the Venetians in particular regarding an anti-Ottoman alliance. So Salim felt completely justified in the fact that the Mamluks were agitating against them to um, lead a war. And of course, from the Mamluks own, own point of view, traditionally Anatolia was, you know, a series of um, independent Beyliks, uh, such as the Karamanids, the Razam, Ram uh, the uh, Ramazanids and the uh, Dokadirids, and many of these Beyliks have been basically absorbed into um, into the Ottoman Empire. And the uh, Ottoman Sultan, you know, one of his many titles was, of course, the uh, uh, the Kargan, which is linking this back to the the, the supposed ancestry of Osman back to um, uh, August Khan. 
uh, the idea that in addition to all the other titles, the, the Ottoman ruler is the um, ruler of all the Turks. And in addition, of course, we have the, the conflict over the fact that the Mamluks are um, essentially holding captive the the Abbasid caliph um, the Abbasid caliph after the uh, the fall of Baghdad I think in the uh, the 1250s um, so all of these things and again trying to elevate this as far as a religious conflict um, give Salim the impetus he needs to attack the Mamluks um, so just to quickly go over this and of course you know elucidate and uh, chime in whenever possible um, the Mamluk sultan at the time is one Al Ghadi. And um, he is defeated very soundly at the uh, the Battle of uh, Majdabik in Syria, uh, during which um, Al Ghali is killed. And um, I think it's also important to note that um, the Mamluk um, the, the Mamluks uh, cavalry themselves are very quickly wiped out in these uh, decisive battles. And the militias and levies, which are there thereafter recruited for the Mamluk cause, are successively weaker. Um, as we sort of explained in our previous stream, one of the incredible feats of the Ottomans is their ability to um, endure defeat after defeat after defeat in the Balkans and reorganize and um, raise new armies and keep on winning battles. Well, unlike the situation in the Balkans, what we see in the Mamluk Sultanate is a well-established prestigious Muslim power that had been in, in existence before the Ottomans, you know, around the, uh, the middle of the 13th century. And from 1516 until 1517, the Mamluk Sultanate is completely absorbed by the Ottoman Empire. You have um, Majdabik, which, you know, absorbs Syria into the battle and, of course, enables um, Salim to take control of Damascus and Jerusalem. And this is um, further cemented by the, uh, the Battle of uh, uh, Yanus. And um, then he moves into Egypt and defeats the new sultan, uh, Tuman Bey, at the uh, Battle of uh, uh, Ridania. And um, after that, the, in addition to this, we have the fall of the secular uh, Mamluk Sultanate. And we also have the capture of the Abbasid Caliph in um, Cairo. Um, the last Abbasid Caliph is one um, al uh, uh, Mutawakil, And he surrenders the Caliphate, among other things, to Salim. So with that, essentially, we have the acquisition of, because, of course, the um, Mamluks I mean, also ruled sort of over... It's a sort of grand, you know, legitimation of his yes. of, of his rule of his Islamic rule. I mean, he's taking control of the holy cities, and he also um because the traditional um title was um ruler of the two holy cities, but he he calls custodian himself of servant, the two, yes. or servant yeah. or custodian, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's also um I think he provides funds to um 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 either beautify or restore the the Kaaba, you know, the sort of black box. Yes. Um, um, so so he, he, he's quite pious in that sense, and he's quite canny in what he's doing. But this is a huge um, sort of PR and political win for him in the Islamic world. It, it's, it's, that's still an understatement. I mean, it's huge. And so, he, uh, to, of course, oh, sorry, good to me. Uh, just very quickly, he, of course, succeeds in doubling at least the size of the empire in the space of just a couple of years. The guy only rules for uh, something like eight. Um, and uh, it's also worth pointing out that, of course, uh, as AM observed, the Mamluks were no pushovers. Um, you know, no, a bottle no. of uh, Ain Jalut, they did. They were one of the few major battles. Uh, it was one of the few major battles where the Mongols were just flatly defeated. So, you know, to, to beat the Mongols at the height of their power was uh, uh, not nothing. Um, also, it's important to understand that Selim brought back the um a number of very very important relics of the prophet that his mantle his sword and other things that uh, are still in istanbul to this day um, and then the last thing to point out in terms of geopolitics is that with the um acquisition of the the mamluk territory uh, not just the holy places but in particular egypt um, we can see the return of an anatolian egyptian with sort of a levant buffer uh dynamic that uh, goes all the way back to the days of, uh, of, of course, the Hittites and the ancient Egyptians as these two powers that are often in conflict mm -hmm. and this axis of power um, and the sort of uneasy relationship at times between Egypt and uh, the core Ottoman dominions of Anatolia um, that continued up into the time of... Uh, What's his name? The uh, the 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 Ottoman uh, guy who I think it's Ali Muhammad Ali or uh, Ali Pasha. Um, 
uh, AM would be able to uh, say more about that, who incidentally was the, also the one eventually in the early 1800s who finally did away with the last of the Mamluks at the, uh, at the Cairo Citadel. But it's just very important in terms of Ottoman history in general to understand this tension between Egypt and Anatolia, um, which it continues uh, to this day, even with things where Erdogan would be getting into spats with uh, uh, Sisi uh, in Egypt. Yeah, and it's not, and it's also um, um, because we must remember at this point, you know, I mean, today we have, you know, modern dam systems and all sorts of um, things messing with it. But you know, even at this period, Egypt is still, um, you know, flooding every year, and it brings this huge wash of nutrients um, 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 down from the from the south into into lower Egypt, and it's 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 a massive basin of agricultural you know fertility and, and massive amounts of food is produced and so that's a huge boon as well um yes. but it also it, it also opens up control into the red sea um um and that vital um trade connection which of course grows and grows um with the indians which will become a huge mm. point of contention with the portuguese under Solomon, which we'll get to yes there's it's another worth... element so sorry, oh, sorry. Marcus. Oh, okay. uh, there's no yeah. <laughs> sorry all right. Um, there's another element to also consider, which is that uh, Selim I is probably the first ruler from Constantinople to have retaken the Levant and Syria since Heraclius. Um, this is what well, you can say, ultimately, the reunification of all of the possessions of the Eastern Roman Empire, um, really bolstering the idea that the uh, Ottoman uh, Sultan, who was, of course, claiming that mantle, is the uh, Kese Edum. He is the Caesar of Rome, in addition to being the uh, uh, the Padishah or the master king, or, you know, in Arabic, the Malik, the king, and now the Halif and the shadow of God, all of these elements together. And of course, you know, the, the fact that the um, uh, the Safavids have been, you know, beaten for now, you know, is one thing. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, the Ottomans have united the former domains of the Eastern Roman Empire, and they have established themselves as the supreme principality uh, within the Muslim world, and of course, the religious and secular ruler of Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims uh, throughout the world, in addition to all of that. Uh, one thing uh, on the, sorry, Marcus, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's almost as if the three of you read my mind, because um, I was actually going to say that if you look at the eastern border of the Ottoman Empire, sort of during the reign of, uh, or rather so towards the end of the reign of uh, Selim I, uh, after his conflict with the Safavids and with the Mamluks, these borders are very reminiscent of, say, the Justinian East Roman Empire type borders, with, with the exception of the Hajars, which you see here in this picture from 1520, um, that it's the Ottomans have established this sort of natural defensive frontier, which sort of is true of the Roman period, is true of the Byzantine period up until Heraclius. Uh, and, and like you say, Apostolic, he's the first... Uh, is the first emperor, the first leader of a nation to do this since Heraclius um, within sort of one unitary state. Um, and the other thing I was going to make mention too is the the fact that he, um, Selim manages to engage the Safavids and the Mamluks piecemeal one at a time. And uh, you guys have already spoken about Shaldaran, so I, I won't go on to it despite the fact that I've got notes. But one observation we'll make is that the, the Iranians and the Egyptians um, in the context of the Safavids and the Mamluks basically fight certainly with the elite aspects of their army almost in, ex exclusively on horseback. And even though in the case of a uh, Shaldaran, the Ottomans do suffer quite, quite, uh, you know, decent casualties. Um, and the Mamluks managed to do well, at least in the initial battles, uh, battle against the Ottomans. But um, the Ottomans are, are, have really in their own way, I mean, we mentioned the Italian wars about how sort of the French and the Spanish had become uh, different expressions of combined arms warfare in the sort of, in the introduction to the gunpowder era. And the and the Turks are doing this as well in their own way. You know, they've really, for, uh, when you look at the, the original Turks from, you know, the the 11th century when they arrive in Anatolia and then with the with the Baliks and, and the encroachment into sort of this weakened Byzantine state in the 13th and 14th century um you know they have they have trouble taking cities you know the the sieges of Bursa and Nicomedia take years to capture because the, the Turks do not have this skill of siege craft but then you fast forward 150 years and then all of a sudden you have you know the Sultan Selim rocking up to a battle with a 100 um a 100 cannon artillery battery um well one be, one thing be, um one thing that the Turks seem to be really good at is getting the best out of the other peoples that are within their dominions, right? Because for the first Correct. great guns, they got Christian and Greek servants to do well, it. Well, Orban, as we spoke about in the previous stream, yeah. Yes, yeah, Orban. Um, yeah, and so, and so, you know, the Janissaries, certainly in the early iteration where I sort of spoke, and they're like this sort of 
immortal slash Rangian type of bodyguard. You know, the proficient in all kinds of weapons, and even the, the the Ottoman levies, despite being irregular troops, are often, you know, they they take a good count of themselves in battle very often. Um, you know, they got a, this artillery corps. Uh, the navy, certainly once they start building a navy under um, Suleiman, you know, under the Corsairs in like Barbarossa and um, and uh, Dragut and the other these other leaders of the navies, they become very proficient on sea despite, you know, some setbacks that they have. Um, you, you know, the, the Ottomans, again, like I say, in their own way, are becoming proficient practitioners of combined arms warfare in this time. And um, these armies of that, uh, that are further east or indeed south in the case of the Mamluks that are more cavalry orientated, despite being able to fight well and inflict casualties on the Ottomans, the Ottomans just brush them aside. And then it's these experiences in the east when they sort of go back to Europe and despite setbacks, like you said, Apostolic, whenever they go back into Hungary or Transylvania, or indeed, you know, when we eventually get to the siege of Vienna, if we get there, um, you know, the Ottomans, despite even when they do suffer losses, they're, they're still fighting with this quite tremendous military proficiency. It's important to understand too, and very much so when we get to uh, Lepanto, which I, I understand we'll eventually arrive at, that until this uh, southern domain was taken, um, and other historians or historians have uh, recognized this, the Ottoman, it was primarily a, a Christian domain. Um, and, and, and particularly when you uh, think about things like the Navy, you have to understand that there were huge, huge numbers. Uh, and I would go so far as to assume, um, uh, th though I'm not aware of any careful studies that have been done of it, but I think it would be a safe assumption that the vast majority of the Ottoman Navy was made up of Christian sailors. So, uh, you know, and their troops uh, were in large part, at least until this period here, when they doubled their domains, their troops were largely uh, Christian. Certainly the Janissaries, former Christian, uh, formed their oh, shock yeah, troop well, I mean, corps. That, I mean, the Navy especially, I mean, I mean, even later, you know, around 1600, there's a guy, um, I think his name's Ozio or Occhio or something, but um, he was a, a, an Italian um, farmer, um, taken when he was a boy, made a galley slave. And um, by the end of his life, he was the Grand Admiral of the Turkish Navy um, and had converted to Islam, of course. But, um, but um, these things did happen. It, it, it was um, not, not impossible and not unremarkable, actually. These things happen quite, quite often. Great. So, um, well, finally, I think we've um, uh, covered uh, Yavuz uh, quite um, extensively. So thank you all for that. Uh, we can move on finally to uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, when uh, Selim the Grim dies in uh, 1520, um, you know, very few mourn him. He was a very stern autocratic ruler who, of course, you know, um, was, you know, m many ways sort of religious zealot who would um, come down hard and very, you know, very minor infractions. And um, when Suleiman, you know, uh, became ruler, it was for the first time in a very long time, in three generations, it was um, uncontested. He only had one brother, uh, Uves, who was um, an eight-year-old at the time. So um, there was no um, mature adult to contest the throne to Suleiman. So Suleiman um, inherited the empire peacefully. And, you know, upon his girding, he, you know, assumed the rank of all of those titles, which had been acquired um, by happened, his father. Um, what happened to the brother? Selim uh, had some, some of them killed. Suleiman had him killed, or Selim. Had, no, I, I meant Selim I had. Uh, well, well uh, go on. I'm sorry, I jumped in there. I am, no, sorry. I meant the um the young one, the eight year old. Um, yes, he he lived until um 1547, in which I think he was um executed because he was involved in a rebellion against uh, Suleiman. Oh, <laughs> there yeah. we go. So yes, anyway, um. He becomes Sultan in terms of his own background. Um, he was the, again, there's a bit of controversy regarding um, uh, his parentage on his mother's side uh, regarding the origin of uh, Hafsa Sultan. Uh, there are essentially two schools. One argue that um, uh, Hafsa was a Crimean noble of the Jure clan, which were, you know, the uh, the vassals in the Crimean Khanate. Um, the other probably more likely scenario is that she was um, a Greek slave. And um, Suleiman was born in Trebizond. And in addition, he served his um, governorships in Crimea. He was um, in former Theodosia and Katha, and then ultimately moved to Adirne. And therefore, being in Adirne, he was in a um, good position to rush and um, claim the mantle of um, Osman. 
And in terms of his early reign, um, first of all, he has to deal with um, a revolt in Damascus, but rather than take up the um, uh, the planned campaign against the Safavids, um, which had been, you know, planned in the last sort of um, a few months of um, Selim's reign, um, he decides instead to go north to go um, into Europe, and um, he couldn't have choose chosen a better time, really, due to the um, incredibly fractured nature of the Hungarian kingdom. Just to put some bit of, uh, in, into a bit of perspective. Um, Hungary had two great leaders throughout the 15th century, John Hunyadi, who had defeated Mehmed II at the um, siege of Belgrade in, in 1456, and uh, Matthias Corvinus, who had established the Black Army and had established a, um, a strong centralized kingship with a professional army, the Black Army. And Corvinus uh, was Hunyadi's son, right? Yes. However, when Corvinus died, the Hungarian magnates instead chose to elect um, his enemy, the weak Vladislaus of Bohemia, um, known to posterity as uh, King Dobre, or essentially the, the man who, set, who agrees to everything, the man who consents to everything. And this is such because Vladislaus essentially consented to whatever his nobles wanted of him, involving essentially surrendering all of his privileges and, you know, demanding the right of counsel, uh, control over the armies and surrendering a large part of the royal estate. Put this in Vladislav's perspective, he's not only ruling over, um, uh, you know, powerful magnates in Bohemia, he's also ruling over powerful magnates in Hungary. So this um, weak king of two very divided realms is unable to contest the power of the magnates. And rather than contest that power and try and wrestle back and centralize royal authority, uh, he capitulates to them. Um, the power of the magnates, of course, um, infuriated the um, the peasants in Hungary. And we have the, uh, the Dostsa, a peasant rebellion in Transylvania, which is um, uh, brutally put down by um, uh, John Zapolya who will um, become an important figure later on. And the effect of this is that when in 1516 uh, Vladislaus dies, he is, he is um, succeeded by his, um, I think it's 10 year old or 15 year old son, uh, Louis II. And um, for the first sort of um, five years of his reign, Hungary is almost completely defenseless. Um, the magnates not, are incredibly apathetic about defending um, Hungary's borders along the Sava and along the Danube, which is in stark contrast uh, to what had been exemplified by the uh, the heroic defense of um, Hungary under John Hunyadi. And so we have the, the first campaign, which is organized by um, Ibrahim Pasha, the the friend of um, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Yeah, they were childhood his, friends, weren't they? Yes, and his then Grand Vizier, um, Piri Mehmed. But I think my my reading of the fall of Belgrade is um, probably a little bit different to um, to most people's, and that I believe it was ultimately a happy accident. Also, um, also, so with so with emphasising just briefly the importance of Belgrade, and especially where it lies, if you if one considers it sits um on the confluence of the Danube, uh, the, the, rather the the Sava branching off from the Danube, and also that it, it sits between the the uh, Sava and the Drava rivers, Belgrade is essentially the keystone into the Pannonian Plain. Yes. It's the keystone yes, across these three rivers, and this is why. You know, Hanyadi, like you said, protected it with great valor and gallantry, and his troops did. Um, um, uh, when was the day of the bat the previous siege? Fourteen fifty six. Fifty six. Um, but for it to fall when it did, um, you see the picture here from fifteen twelve. It just opens the gateway for an even stronger Ottoman Empire, as it was in fifteen twenty the fifteen twenties, to march north. And as we all know, they got as far as Vienna once they took Belgrade. Yes, I think just um, just organizing this though, I think Mehmed II, it has, it has to be emphasized, uh, was placed against some of the most um, audacious and um, uh, daring um, opposition in the form of Dracula, in the form of John Hunyadi, in the form of... Um, Skanderbeg. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. when Suleiman the Magnificent um, becomes uh, uh, Sultan in 1520, um, most of the significant opposition has already been defeated, and Hungary is a weak and divided kingdom, and this is Correct. exemplified by the mm -hmm. um, the state of Belgrade. Um, Belgrade mm -hmm. was actually a, well, wasn't actually the primary target of the first invasion of Hungary. Um, Ahmed Pasha, and again, this draws us back to our previous conversation regarding um, uh, Kandali Halil Pasha, the the inherited Grand Vizier of Mehmed II, uh, part of the first sort of two years of his reign is uh, Mehmed trying to seize control essentially from his Grand Vizier. Well, of course, Hiri Mehmed was the um, Grand Vizier of uh, Selim, and uh, Ahmed Pasha, the second Vizier, was basically 
uh, competing to basically oust it's them. A common, it's a common conflict you see between the young sultan and the old vizier who sort yes. of expects, expects a say in the administration. Yes, actually. precisely. And in this case, we have the two viziers of advocating two plans. Uh, Ahmed Pasha doesn't want to attack um, Belgrade. Instead, he advocates attacking the uh, the city of Sabash and moving along the river Sava to the west and uh, attacking, basically bypassing Belgrade altogether. And Piri Mehmed, the um, the inherited Grand Vizier, instead basically ignores this and decides to um, uh, besiege Belgrade anyway. Uh, Ahmed Pasha's plan to attack via Sabash ended in complete disaster. Um, the uh, the Sava River flooded, making any sort of um, invasion across it impossible. Um, however, um, Piri Mehmed has had been able to maintain the siege, and Belgrade was only. Um, uh, only had something like a thousand to seven hundred defenders, meaning that when Suleiman arrived with reinforcements to aid his Grand Vizier, uh, the city basically fell and all the um, uh, defenders capitulated and were spared uh, by Suleiman. So um, essentially, the fall of Belgrade is the result of Hungarian incompetence, and you, you can almost say, you know. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not even how sure how to describe it in terms of, um, like, again, it wasn't um, the principal objective of the Ottomans' plan, and the Ottomans, of course, um, didn't use this opportunity to actually press their advantage. Campaigning season was over, and um, after taking... Um, after taking the city of um, uh, Belgrade, they instead decided to attack the city of Rose. But just to organize how incompetent the Hungarians were, um, Louis II had organized a relief mission for the city of Belgrade. However, it was too slow in terms of the, um, the raising of the forces. And um, it simply disbanded on its own volition, essentially, even before it reached Belgrade. Um, well, I mean, it's a, it's a lethal competition. Where, it's a lethal combination, rather, where you have... Um, um, a feudal system. It's not a professional army, but then all of the nobles are fighting with the king, and so of course it's not going to work because of course you rely on the nobles to organize and, and levy the army. So it's naturally going to be a disaster. This also <laughs> emphasizes as well the certainly from you might say the period. Oh, you could almost say from sort of Bayezid the Thunderbolt till until um, you know Suleiman that there's a there's a considerable energy with the way that the Ottomans engaging campaigns whether it's the, the the last siege of constantinople whether it's um you know the the conflicts with the safavids whether it's the capture of belgrade um there's there's a tremendous energy there's a tremendous and i sort of mentioned this about skanderbeg when we we're talking last week that the the, the Turks themselves, you know, is some often their enemies tend to sort of either languish or sort of act with um, haste or they're a little bit disorganized. But the Turks seem to arrive at each of these battles well prepared, um, you know, with a combined arms army that is, you know, often well led um, with highly motivated troops. And in the case of, say, Suleiman's campaigns in Hungary, Hungary, which we'll obviously talk about a little bit later, you know, he, he, he's the kind of leader that doesn't dither. You know, and, and you see this in history with generals, you know, whether it's Alexander, whether it's Caesar, whether it's even Napoleon later on, you have to march with intent and with, and with energy and a campaign has to have thoughtfulness and focus. And I, I see this in these Turkish campaigns from this time period. It's very, very obvious. Yes, and this is exemplified in um, the attack on Rhodes because, of course, uh, talking about um, Rhodes in particular, um, the Knights Hospitaller had, of course, been um, positioned in Antioch um, during the period of the Altrema, and thereafter, mm. it, I believe, been gifted and, and to... Um, yes, it had been gifted to... Um, Rhodes had been gifted by the then Byzantine Emperor, or mm -hmm. was it a... Um, yes, and then, of course, it became part of the um, the wider Francocratia. Um, nevertheless, yep. for 300 years, uh, Rhodes had been controlled by the um, Knights Hospitaller, which had, you know, garrisons from England, garrisons from France, garrisons from Germany, garrisons from Italy. Spanish and, contingents, um, yeah. And Spanish contingents all across Europe. And um, Rhodes essentially had become a major source of um, maritime raiding for the Christians. Um, it was essentially a, um, a hostile center of... Um, of a, 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 a hostile center, you know, wedged in the middle of the the Ottoman um, Eastern Mediterranean. Now they had conquered um, Anatolia, Greece, uh, Levant, and Egypt. Um, you have three islands right in the center, which are held by um, hostile powers. One, of course, is Venice, controlling Cyprus and controlling Crete. Um, however, have unlike um, uh, the Ro uh, the Knights of Rhodes, uh, the Venetians can be placated through various trading arrangements with the Ottomans, um, such as the capitulation. However, the um, knights were far less amenable, and so one of the um, 
um, first campaigns that um, uh, Suleiman decides on is to seize control of the island of Rhodes and by any means necessary, essentially e echoing your point you made. And he, um, and he, and he spares, determination. yeah. He spares nothing in his preparations. You know, we, we the Great Siege of Malta is sort of seen as one of the great campaigns of the of the of the Ottoman period uh, from this period. But uh, the Siege of Rhodes is very much on its own level. The, the fact that the Sultan assembles an army of a hundred thousand men to take this one island when he was facing a garrison of maybe seven thousand ish. Um, roughly around you, the same. You, you, We're talking roughly around the same numbers, Constantinople. Though. Correct. Ex exactly. So um, <laughs> Suleiman is Thermopylae. not is not going to is is not going to the extent of um. Oh, well, what I'm saying he's not sparing anything to take the island. He's not taking half measures. He's going to roads to capture it. Well, I yes, think also and... the knights. The knights were engaged in a lot of piracy as well. Yes, right? precisely. Oh, yeah. Attacking Turkish Seaf ships, seafaring. Yeah. yeah, piracy. Yeah. Yes, like I said, um, there was a strategic necessity for taking roads because any naval operation, any attack on Italy, any attack on Cephalonia, any attack on um, Crete um, would be undermined by the constant attacks from the um, the Rhodesian Navy, essentially, Columbus. So yes, um, there was a strategic necessity in taking the island. And in taking the island, um, Suleiman lost roughly around half of this force, not all to the siege, but um, due to... Um, due to disease among other things but nevertheless there was a huge um toll in taking the um taking the city uh, taking the city of Rhodes, mm -hmm. and once um the city had fallen um the knights were essentially given the opportunity to retreat into western europe thereafter eight years later uh, they were gifted the island of malta by charles v and therefore established their order again yes well it's, apparently it's, it's that's um that's one thing that Suleiman really um regretted when you come to malta later on apparently he lamented that he let them go <laughs> he said it was one of his greatest mistakes well the thing with the the thing with the the rhodian campaign as well is that um he he arguably took probably too large a force because what had happened is and i mean i know we sometimes talk about battles in depth sometimes we we brush on them but maybe because we have so much to talk about i will just talk a little bit about this um the knights of st john there were 703 knights on the island um and approximately uh, i think about f uh, the the garrison that was in the city when the turks landed was about six thousand um half of which were native rhodians and about two or three thousand which were a venetian contingent which actually sailed from venice uh, sorry which sailed from cyprus uh, the cypriot garrison uh, which were Venetian, sailed to, to Rhodes to help them because the Grand Master actually sent letters to Europe and literally got no reply. He was completely left to his own devices. So it was with a force of 6,703 men, which they held the island for months on end. And what the and what uh, the mistake that Suleiman possibly made is that he landed too late in the campaign season because what happened is that the, the Rhodians had a chance to take in the harvest and um, and you know, picked all the trees, cleaned the orchards out, um, they brought in all the livestock into the city, and there was nothing on the island for the Turks to do. And supplying a force of, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30,000 is difficult on an island. This is trying to supply 100,000 men is, you know, hard enough to do on the continent, yeah, but on I an mean, island where, where is impossible. Where, where do you get water for them as well? I mean, and, it's an impossible yeah. challenge. And this is why, despite the fact that um, they undermined the walls and they b really pelted the, the fortifications with their heavy artillery, of which I think, again, there was nearly 100-odd pieces of it, um, uh, the, this is why Suleiman did let the Rhodians go, or at least the Knights of St. John go, on an agreement because as much as the Rhodians were simply running out of defenders to defend the walls, um, you know, they just had so few lives to spare. The Turks were being absolutely ravaged by famine and by supply mm. problems. And he was, he was quite eager to, to finish the campaign. One thing I actually do want to mention is because um, we, we make, I don't know how deep we're going to go into the Turkish history side of things down the track or the, uh, the Hungarian walls or whatever, but the, the, the defenders of roads actually devised a really clever method um, of detecting sapping. Um, and I just want to be really quick. It's just, I won't, I'll, I'll miss, a chance to state this otherwise and what they would do is around certain uh, part, portions of the wall they would drive two stakes into the ground you know like you know stakes you'd put in a garden or whatever and they would actually um almost like a harp string tie animal sinew i'm assuming it'd be like sort of stomach line or something like that and from that they would actually hang bells so whenever the <laughs> ottoman sappers and the and the uh diggers the trench diggers were trying to dig on the walls to plant explosives you know the finest um 
movement in the earth would ring these bells off. And so what the the, the defenders would do is, um, you know, because like uh, Apostolic said, they had contingents from Germany, from Spain. You know, there would have been sort of engineers among the European contingents as well. They would actually countermine and drop mm -hmm. countermines and blow up the um the Turkish so trench like, or whatever. Um, and so, so the like Turks had a really hard time undermining. Yeah, essentially. It was yeah, actually really clever. It's web, sensing the yeah. vibrations. I quite like Very that. much so, yeah. Hoist with their you know, own the, petard. Quite, quite, but I mean, as we, as as I'm sure everyone has gotten the 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 uh, idea of the 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 Nassus and John and the Brodians were exhausted, and they came to terms with um with Suleiman. So the knights did re relocate eventually to Malta, and the I believe the the conditions for the Brodians were that they were their their churches were spared. Um, they were not none of them were massacred or or captured or put into slavery and i believe they weren't subject to taxes for five years so basically they were permitted to rebuild the city without um the, the burden of uh, of paying tax of the sultan which was a rare occurrence actually that the yeah it's a pretty the, the, the deal. lenient mm. yes the jizya in particular but yes i mean there, there is obviously um a an overall advantage for Suleiman, which is allowing themselves to repair the damage then taxing them later um however i think um yes i think this um uh, caps off quite nicely our conversation on roads thank you for that marcus and brings us on to the um the fate of hungary and the rather um decisive campaign uh culminating the battle of mohash so in terms of what um measures essentially Louis II and the Hungarians were attempting to shore up the position vis-a-vis -vis the Ottomans. Um, we mentioned on our stream, Columba, uh, regarding the Habsburgs, that in 1515, Maximilian had organized the Congress of, um, the then Congress of Vienna, not the later Congress of Vienna, uh, whereby there was an arrangement that the Jigelion family should marry into the Habsburg family. And in 1528, uh, 1522, uh, Mary von Habsburg, the sister of Ferdinand and Charles V, uh, finally married is Louis II. And Louis II appoints a archbishop, um, Ramoli, to try and desperately shore up the um, fortifications um, north of the now Ottoman city of Belgrade, uh, such as um, uh, Peter Varad. And nevertheless, uh, there is such little enthusiasm on part of the local gentry magnates that um, uh, Paul Ramori is actually forced to use his own revenue from his bishoporic in order to fund basically you know the garrisoning and the maintaining of these various fortresses um, and of course this is insufficient so when Suleiman begins his next campaign into Hungary in earnest in 1526 um, most of these fortresses along the Danube along the Sava basically fall without a fight um, the Hungarian army when Suleiman does finally invade is divided into three. You have the Transylvanians under Zapolia and you have the Croatians and of course you have the Royal Army under Louis II and this is where I think it's fair to say that Louis II is a rather tragic figure especially considering the awful estate he had inherited from um, his predecessor Vladislav II. Um, Louis II essentially believed the only way to defeat the Ottomans was by buying you know um, land for time essentially retreating and retreating and retreating until all of his armies were able to unite and then defeat the Ottomans on favorable ground. However However, because of the um, the privileges afforded to the nobility, they held their own war council and essentially compelled Louis II to fight what would later be conclusively proven prematurely um, the Ottomans using his royal army and not the combined armies of Hungary um, at the field of Mohash, which was boggy and um, very unfavorable for the sort of tactics which the Hungarians were going to utilize, which is the um, uh, the ferocious charge using essentially shock tactics to overcome the um, Ottoman advantage heavy in cavalry, artillery. Right. Yes, heavy cavalry in particular using um, a number of um, uh, German mercenaries. Uh, so yes, uh, this gets us to the um, Battle of Mahash. Does um, anyone want to um, uh, elucidate what happened at the uh, the Battle of Mahash? I mean, there are um, there are conflicting reports, but essentially, I think that um, the the right the the right of the Hungarian army, this heavy heavy cavalry, essentially came um, um, slamming sort of across into sort of the left, but maybe the center of the Ottoman army. Um, this muddy ground bogged them down, um, and of course, the lines a mess. I mean, whilst they were engaged in that fighting, um, the Ottoman right um, on the other side, um, which was composed of the sort of best Janissary troops on the right, essentially were told to just charge furiously and charged um, using their their um, their cannon and their 
and their uh, and their muskets, which of course had also decimated the heavy heavy cavalry on the other side and um, swept up the line and disorganized them. And there was a slaughter of something like um, fourteen thousand, I think. Um, so it was just it was just a total disaster, um, badly planned, badly coordinated, and with inferior equipment on the on the Hungarian side. So and um, also it was. Wasn't there a dispute between Stephen Balthroy, uh, Bathory as well, uh, and as along with the king, where sort of certain contingents of the army wouldn't follow no one but the king and would not take orders from Bathory? That doesn't not surprise mistaken. me, considering. Um, yeah, exactly. And and what's um, interesting too, you mentioned about the portions of the battle where um sort of things take place because both sides have artillery, but the Ottoman uh, uh, the uh, artillery um, is more numerous and probably better as well. The Hungarians, and you see this a few times, is sort of almost what I like to call the uh, kind of cephalae problem, where the one uh, one wing is almost too powerful and the other wing isn't weak and uh, isn't strong enough and is too weak. And so the Hungarians actually prevail on, on on their right flank when they charge the Ottoman left, and they sort of get almost to the Ottoman camp, but the the auxiliary cavalry sort of rally. And so does that wing. They sort of rally together with the reserves in the camp. Meanwhile, the Hungarian, the main portion of the army, advances on the Ottoman right and centre. And just as the Hungarian foot knights and, and their sort of infantry arrive at the line, the, 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 the cannons all fire in their position, you know, shredding their ranks to pieces. And then it's the, the Janissaries counterattack, like you say, with sort of an astonishing degree of aggression and um you know sort of almost fanaticism but they cut down the hungarian center and sort of the the hungarian right wing which did succeed has to pull back because the rest of the army is disintegrating and because the 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 hungarian center disintegrated the hungarian right which was uh, stuck in the mud like you say got encircled it's by off. the it's cut off got sort of cut down as well so very few fragments of the Hungarian centre and left survive. So the right wing, which again nearly made to the camp, but has had to pull back, has suffered its own set of casualties retreating. And so this army, um, which didn't really at attack in an organised fashion, or rather one wing was wildly successful and the centre and the left were not successful, was so spread apart they couldn't support each other, where sort of the, the way the because the Turks were on a defensive and also were on a hilltop protected by a river, had all the defensive advantage. And so the Hungarians were sort of cut down um, in this forlorn attack and, you know, 15,000 of Hungary's best warriors land the, 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 the ground at Mohax within, you know, a, a half a day. Well, not yeah, even, not even hours. Uh, and I believe in the wake of the battle as well, um, Suleiman was pretty cruel. He had um, something like two thousand of his um, of the prisoners that he had taken executed whilst mm. he watched um, from a yeah. golden chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, not only great. well, not only are we seeing the the felling of uh, you know mercenaries, a considerable part of the Hungarian aristocracy, but we're also seeing the death of Louis II as well. And probably right. of the you know, in addition to Hungary losing the battle, I think it's the actual physical death of the king. Who um, mm. drowned in his armor, uh, trying to escape, and was later discovered as you in can see river, the, yeah. um, the image you can see. Um, this is mm. going to have the biggest knock-on effect because this causes a succession mm. crisis. The ultimate um, material effects for the Ottomans are, are quite unclear um, because, from in terms of again just the immediate aftermath of the battle, uh, you mentioned there was a, um, a wholesale execution of prisoners of war. Well, um, mm. Suleiman was very paranoid. Uh, because he believed that because the victory was so easy, um, he was expecting another contingency of um, Hungarians to attack him at any point. Yeah, even, even and so, um, waited around for a couple of weeks and didn't advance. Yes. <laughs> so, so I think just um, in terms of trying to understand that, if he is e expecting, anticipating an attack, then you can view the um, execution of prisoners of war not as a random act of cruelty, but as an act of what you would consider military necessity yeah, to so avoid it's the kind attack. Of, um, it kind of goes back to our conversation about Henry V. <laughs> It's, yes. it's also worth considering too, um, just for the for the sake of the chat. Um, the Ottomans have well, estimates range from fifty to one hundred thousand. I think probably sixty to seventy is about correct. With and 300 about thirty million. to forty, yes, about thirty yeah. to forty thousand Hungarians. Hungarians, of which um, only fifty artillery guns arrived in time for the battle. Um, and more importantly, of its four commanders, the only one that survived the, of its main commanders, the only one that survived was actually, ironically, Balthory, who um, many of the contingents didn't want to follow. Uh, Louis, uh, Tomori, and Zapoya all are killed at this battle. 
which is a, a monumental loss of um, leadership within the Hungarian state mm. and army. I mean, another thing that we see is um, the larger the army is, um, the more severe are the consequences of having that kind of divided organization. I mean, mm. we kind of talked about that um, in our streams on the um, the armies that the Eastern European kings sent against the Mongols, where again, mm. you'll have these different divisions led by a different king or lord, and it never ends well, and, and, and it always goes no. terribly badly, and you'll have commanders dying. Um, um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's always a poor show. Wonderful. So moving on to the um, the immediate aftermath after the, um, again, the the reluctant march on Buda after uh, Suleiman had been convinced that there was no further Hungarian army to reinforce this one. Um, two kings are elected. In Plesburg, the traditional capital for electing kings of Hungary, modern day Bratislava, um, Ferdinand of Austria, who is the um, brother-in-law, of um, uh, Louis II is elected and establishes the Habsburg monarchy on the throne of um, Hungary. In the east, the Transylvanian magnates um, elect John Sapoya as the king of Hungary. And this leads to the awkward situation where Sapoya freely accepts the suzerainty and paying tribute to Suleiman. Um, in addition to, and again, from his point of view, you can argue that he did this to it retains some sort of integrity for Hungary, whereby if he were to align himself with Suleiman, then Suleiman wouldn't be fighting against the Hungarians. Suleiman would be fighting for his claim as King of Hungary against Ferdinand, who had been elected in Pressburg. And well, is there not the also a, um, a religious element to the sort of Transylvanian support? Because of course, um, you know, the Habsburgs are, you know, um, the prime, you know, Catholic defenders, and then you also have, um, you know, Hussite elements amongst these sort of um, um, more more Turk friendly um, um, opponents. Because of you know, of course, the Turks also have a, a policy of, I guess, tolerance when it comes to such divisions. You know, they yes, don't not, really um, care. Not necessarily Hussite. Hussite's more of a Bohemian phenomena, but the Turkish. Um, uh, Reformation does take off in Transylvania um, during the later period we're talking about under um, John II Sigismund uh, Sapoya. Um, he famously converts, I think, three times to various um, sects of um, <laughs> uh, Christianity. And I think it's important to note at this time under Ferdinand and um, under the early um, uh, Austrian Habsburgs post um, uh, Charles uh, that they weren't as fervent in their defense of the Catholic Church as they would be later at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. So that issue is. Yeah. I suppose slightly, we're we're slightly too early here by maybe 10 yes, years, 15 slightly years. Slightly too early, but it does ultimately play a factor, yes. And of course, um, the, the logical target now is because Ferdinand is claiming um, sovereignty over a portion of Hungary, which roughly corresponds to um, Nitra, which is modern-day Slovakia, Western Hungary, and Royal Croatia, uh, establishing so-called Royal Hungary. Um, uh, Suleiman decides to uh, pursue Vienna itself, and um, we've covered the siege of Vienna in a bit more depth on our stream we did on the um, on, on the imperial city of Vienna. Um, so do check that out if you want a bit more um, of the actual history of Vienna itself. Uh, needless to say, um, it is the first major setback for Suleiman. Uh, he assaults the city. Um, and ultimately fails due to you know a combination of the weather or the fact that there was a a much larger contingent of um holy roman um troops the fact that um bohemia had um become part of the of the monarchy as well as a result of the um the fall of louis the second um marcus is there anything you want to say um well, I suppose it's, you've already covered it in that stream more or less but i I will say that even though Suleiman did suffer the setback at Vienna um he did manage to uh, acquire sort of large parts of what you might call traditional Hungary, um, so the southern part of it that lay sort of south of the Danube, and he did uh, capture a large number of fortresses on the way there to is, Vienna. There, there, is a, well, there is a proviso to that, though, yes. um, which is, yes, he's taking over these fortresses. He occupies mm. the city of Budapest twice mm. in 1526 Correct. to 1529, but the Ottomans mm. are not formally annexing these territories yet. Correct. They're nominally Indeed. doing it on behalf of their vassal, John Sapoya. Of course, yes, this... Um, right. Of course, this changes because there is a second attempt to um, attack Vienna in 1532. And again, this doesn't even reach Vienna. And from 1539 to 1540, Ferdinand 
pushes back and attempts to, um, and he very successfully um, d takes over Budapest, um, retakes most of Hungary, uh, leading to a Ottoman um, counteroffensive. Uh, Sepoya dies in 1540, and so rather than gifting the Hungarian kingdom to his um, son and successor John II Sigismund, um, Suleiman decides simply to annex the central plains of Hungary and create the various um, Hungarian Ialets which are going to be there in force until the um, the aftermath of the later siege of Vienna in 1683. And Therefore then, in, um, sorry, after you. Oh no, sure, go ahead. I was going to say that. Um, then we get to I think it's 41, um, and then the um, Charles and Ferdinand try to retake Buda again after they lose it, and they fail. And then this time, the Turks sort of, I suppose, make use of that momentum and they occupy um, even more fortresses and castles. Um, yes. So it's a sort of losing battle. Yes, what we're, what we're trying to elucidate here, and one of those um, concessions of that um, failed attempt to uh, retake uh, Budapest, is that Ferdinand temporarily renounces the title of King of Hungary. And this is going to be a lot of diplomatic to and fro regarding all the treaties regarding, you know, forswearing of certain titles. One title that um, the Ottomans uh, very much refused to countenance is addressing Charles V as a legitimate emperor. Yes, because emperor. of course he the Holy Roman Emperor. And Suleiman claiming that um, mantle which had been taken Taken by conquest during the reign of his um, uh, grandfather Mehmet II, um, insisted that he was the Caesarium, he was the Cargan of all the world, essentially. Yeah, there can and only be there one um, universal emperor, emperor. Yes, if there was one person to claim the mantle of universal dominion, it was the Ottoman Sultan, and um, no other ruler, especially um, the Holy Roman Emperor, could claim that mantle. Um, nevertheless, the Hungarian situation is essentially stagnant. Um, after Mohash, we see the collapse of a independent Hungary is the most significant thing to take away, and of course this leads to the um, uh, the famous sort of saying in Hungary, Tobis Veshet Mohashnal, more was lost at Mohash, uh, because it is, it's basically the loss of um, Hungarian independence. We see uh, only really after the loss of um, World War One do we see a regaining yeah. of um, Hungarian independence. And of course it is a debilitating piece um, that the proviso for its finally acquiring independence. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, the, um, the Zapoya monarchy in the East, um, they eventually abandon the title of King of Hungary and they instead adopt the far more sort of um, diminutive rank of the princes of Transylvania. And Transylvania becomes a loyal Ottoman vassal for the next um, 150 years or relatively loyal, whereas the Ottomans uh, again occupy Buda and the land around that connecting Buda to Belgrade and periodically they will attack, they will gain land, they will lose land in Slovakia. And um, this is a ongoing conflict which sees no definitive resolution until 1683. It's so you can say how um, sort of contrary to that popular image of you know um, Vlad Dracul impaling the Turks, Transylvania was actually very sympathetic to Ottoman rule or more sympathetic. Uh, it's interesting, interesting. Interesting you say that, Columba, because at this point in time, it must also be taken into account that both Wallachia and um, Moldavia, Moldova or Moldavia are also in a state of vassalage to the Ottoman Sultan as well, along with Transylvania. Well, yeah, I mean, wasn't it, um, I believe, um, Vlad Dracul's own brother was friends with Mehmet. His name was Radu. So they, well, they were... Was... They were they he were was, quite he intimate was, with them. He was Maybe Mehmet's more than friends. I don't know. <laughs> Oof. I think it's fair to say. Um, yes, friend, I don't think is the, quite the correct way of um, describing Mehmet it. Maybe Mehmet imitated the Greeks a bit too much, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> the English um, vice was apparently rampant at the Ottoman court. <laughs> <laughs> English or Greek, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Semigog, is there anything you want to um, say regarding the, the fate of Hungary? No, no, nothing to add. Right, but well, this um, takes us on to a, a broad summary of the of the further uh, conquests of um, uh, Suleiman before we get on to the, um, the issue of, you know, um, his legal and cultural uh, achievements and the ultimate uh, plaguing issue of the succession. Um, Taking this back now to the Safavids, whilst um, he's unable to gain any sort of decisive victory over the Austrians, he then turns his attention to the campaign which originally should have commenced his reign, which was um, uh, defeating the Safavid Shah. Um, now at this point, uh, Ismail is dead and he has been replaced by his um, 
his son uh, Tamasp, and um, from 1532 until 1535, um, first of all, it's um, uh, Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha who wages the conflict and Suleiman eventually joins him. Um, this campaign is you know, moderately successful in the sense that this is the campaign where most of Eastern Anatolia is secured for the Ottomans and Belgrade, sorry, um, Baghdad uh, falls to the Ottomans for the first time. And of course the Baghdad had been the center of Islam under the Abbasid Caliphate, albeit it had been, it had lost most of its um, economic and um, uh, cultural importance after the sack of Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad was um, you know, very much a shadow of its former self when Suleiman uh, acquires it in 15, the 1530s. And I think it also indicates how um, little in the way of a prize it was that the Persians were able to abandon it so quickly. When traditionally, of course, this area, the, um, uh, the, the center of the, the central the Mesopotamian caliphate. region, yes, yeah. it was well, no, not, not just the center of the caliphate, but if you're trying to resurrect a Sasanian empire or an Archimanid empire, of course, the traditional capital of the Sasanian empire was at Tessaphon, which was very close to Baghdad. Yes. So the Persians are abandoning essentially the traditional um, center of power of the Persian dynasties. And of course, this is one of the issues which um, plagues um, Iran is that there is no obvious center of um, center of power. Uh, Tabriz is very vulnerable and as we see is very often captured. Eventually uh, Shah Abbas will establish Esfahan as the um, capital mm. of the um, of the Safavid dynasty, but even then, under the um, later Qajari dynasty, uh, Tehran will be established as the local capital. So, um, all the capitals which, which, are, which are far more defensible than what Tabriz would have been, because once this frontier moves eastwards, as it has, you, as you can see on this map, it's just far too close to the Ottoman frontier in order to be sort of defensible, given the military proficiency of the empire at this point. Yes. Um, so this is a partial success. Of course, um, this, uh, I mean, kind of like, you know, going back to Julian's campaigns, um, you can say that uh, Suleiman uh, was far more ambitious than just taking um, uh, Baghdad and taking Eastern Anatolia. Rather, he wanted to conquer the entirety of the Safavid Empire, uh, again, for the purpose of not only achieving the, um, the conquest of um, uh, Alexander the Great, but also in eliminating the main uh, religious competitor to your claim to universal rule over Islam, i.e., getting rid of the um, uh, the Shia Twelve religion, essentially. Yes, and, and like um, and like Alexander the Great, his Persian rival employs a tactic of running away, essentially, utilizing yes. vast distance. Yes, exactly. Uh, Tamas essentially just um, keeps retreating, using the ability of his army to avoid ever having to um, interact with Suleiman. Um, so virtually all of the casualties of Suleiman's grand campaign into Iran are um, are due to consumption, are due to disease, well, yes, are due to um, forced to march this army into like the harsh high plains. I mean, that's something that even plagued the Achaemenids. You know, I mean, there are accounts of um, the Achaemenids under Darius um, marching through the exact same location um, to try and get after the um, the Scythians, and they're just decimated by the exact same problems. So it's a it's an old old problem to say the least. And um, I mean, in terms of like, you know, relating this back to our streams on the Eastern Roman Empire, um, the Ottomans, of course, are try again, and they fail in 1548 and 1549. And finally, in 1555, we have the, uh, the Peace of Amasia, uh, which establishes this border. And this is actually a very um, significant historical agreement, because these are essentially the borders, you know, we're talking about uh, Khuzestan, uh, the division of Kurdistan, essentially, modern borders of Armenia. Um, this is essentially the border which exists today between Iran and Iraq, um, was the border established by uh, Suleiman at the Peace of Amesia in 1555. And rather than looking back to the legacy of, you know, the traditional boundaries of the Byzantine Empire in the east, which were at the Euphrates, uh, you can say that Suleiman is imitating uh, Trajan, in the fact that he's able to push the boundaries decisively into Mesopotamia and Eastern Anatolia. And crucially, he takes the port city of Basra, and this opens up another um, uh, trade conduit towards India. And of course, he annexes um, the what we're now known as the eastern parts of Saudi Arabia on the western part of the Persian Gulf as well. Um, but nevertheless, he is unable to achieve his ultimate um, aim, which is to conquer Safavid Iran. Mm. The, it, it's worth sort of saying that he's the first first emperor to rule from Constantinople whose troops have bathed in the uh, Persian Gulf. 
Because that's what they famously say about Trajan's legions. Yes, precisely. Mm-hmm. Um, of oh, course, yeah. also. I've forgotten about that. But then also, he also has um, um, bases in Yemen as well, right? And, and, the, and the oh yes, of, this, and the, uh, th- yeah. This um, this opens up an entire new frontier of conflict because, as you can see on this map, um, Suleiman, in, in addition to you know controlling the cities of Medina and Mecca, goes further and annexes very various bases along the Red Sea. And just to put this in perspective, he is now entering into a major um, military conflict with the a newly established trade hegemon of the Indian Ocean, namely the Portuguese Empire. Mm. And this, you know, is where we get to the crucial aspect of, you know, what were the, the effects of the um, uh, the Western sort of um, maritime supremacy and the voyages, the, um, you know, the legacy of um, Henry the Navigator, was that by the 1480s, um, the Cape of Good Hope had been discovered, and there was now a way to circumvent um, Ottoman control and Ottoman access to India for the first time. And the Portuguese established various trading posts of course, they eventually established Goa in India. They established a presence in Malacca, um, in the in in, in, in modern day Malaysia, near Indonesia, and of course, eventually set up um, bases in Japan, in China, in Macau, uh, bases all across um, East Nagasaki. Africa. Um, yes, Mozambique in particular in East Africa, and um, in order yeah. and at the same time. So we're talking, you know, 1540s, um, 1550s. Um, Humayun, the uh, uh, Padishah of the Mughals has just um, taken back control over northern India and I think it's if I remember rightly it's in 1556 um, he is succeeded by his son Akbar who would later consolidate and you know aggrandize the the Mughal dynasty into yes you know, Ak- Akbar is one of the most sort of fabulous and famous of the Mughal emperors and he actually corresponded with Suleiman Yes, so this would have been at the end of Suleiman's reign and the beginning of Akbar's reign. But nevertheless, the the crucial facet of this is that there there is a twofold relationship here. Um, The Mughals are a Sunni power which have a natural rival in the Safavid Persians. Uh, They will continuously fight over, for example, the easternmost regions of um, Afghanistan, Kandahar, uh, the city of Balkh, etc., will change hands continuously uh, the against Kashmir. the Safavids. Yes, the Kashmir. So you're basically setting up um, a, another front which to wage war against the Safavids. But of course, um, the Mughals have a natural interest in establishing good relations with the Ottomans so they could get unfettered access to the holy sites. Uh, the Haji, the pilgrimage, of course, is a vital aspect of being a Muslim. And of course, unfettered trade access. But right in the middle of these two great um, Sunni powers, you have the Portuguese interfering and trying to dominate trade in this region. And what is, you know, basically proven is that whilst, um, you know, uh, Suleiman takes over the the city of Aden, um, the Portuguese are able to establish um, a trade presence, which is basically hegemonic, until the decline of the Portuguese empire in the 17th century, during which the Ottoman empire itself is in decline. It's worth, it's worth, um, go Colombo, I'll go after you. I was just going to say that um, I was quite amazed when um, when reading about this how far flung some of these um, these conflicts were because you had a, a one of those um, very far flung eastern sultanates in Aceh um, in Indonesia essentially. Yes, this um, is on the um, the island of Sumatra. Yes, Sumatra, mm. and they were being um, essentially hassled by the Portuguese, and they appealed to the Turks for aid. And the Turks actually sent a force. You know, and the Turkish navy was was you know nothing to be sniffed at. But I was just amazed. And that's the introduction to the is that's the introduction too to the Islamification of Indonesia as well. Is Ottoman yes, intervention? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, it's one of the um, largest um, Muslim countries in the world. But well, in, fairness, amazing, in, fairness, in fairness, in fairness, Marcus, um, Muslims have been established in that region since I think the ninth century. So, oh um, no, they had, no had they got there earlier, no doubt about it. But I'm yeah. saying is it, it became most definitely an ingrained part of culture with the Ottomans arriving because they were, you'd say, the most powerful entity to make their presence known that far away from their origin point. I think in terms but, of but your um, point is correct, no doubt. In terms of Islamification, I would argue it's less significant because of Islamification, because I think that's already taken place. I would argue what we're seeing is um, how far flung these conflicts are regarding the conflict with mm. Portugal in particular, because, like I said, the Portuguese had taken Malacca at the beginning of the 16th century. Mm. Uh, Malacca is just across from Sumatra in terms of that access, and of course, if you control the area around Singapore, you control Malaysia. You basically mm. control trade access throughout not only Indonesia 
example, you control trade access from Europe to China and Japan at the same time. Correct. So yeah, the, the Orient. Them, yeah. Yes, so controlling Malaysia and Singapore is mm. crucial for the entire sort of trade atmosphere. So again, I think it yeah. speaks to the Ottoman ambition. And again, this idea that um, Suleiman is uh, the Khalif of all of Islam, uh, that yeah. he wants to form alliances with Muslim powers any way he can in order to and, um, second by the power of the Portuguese. Yes. Yeah. And just and just to speak on the Portuguese very briefly, I mean, we have to consider too that you notice on this map here that the 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 Ottomans just have a slight hold in what sort of modern day Eritrea. Um, there's a, a massive campaign where the uh, just to the south here, where the Ottomans are allying with the uh, with the sort of native Eritreans and to the south, the native Somalis who are Islamic by this point. And sort of between these two countries is a Christian Ethiopia, which is supported by uh, Portuguese. Um, and if you travel further east, um, there's a port in India called Diu. And there's three battles fought in fifty years over the city of Diu because depending whoever the whoever the the petty rule of Diu is at a given time, one of them was supported by the Portuguese, another one was supported by the Ottomans, and this is sort of uh, one of the better trade cities um, on the that lies on the west part of the subcontinent. Um, these skirmishes are happening everywhere, and, and the, the Portuguese themselves are establishing little fort. If you look through um, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, there's a whole bunch of little islands um, or little peninsulas. Uh, for example, you have um, Bahrain and Qatar um, in the Persian Gulf. The Portuguese are setting up little fortress islands um, throughout here with the intent, intent purpose of interdicting um, uh, Ottoman trade. But with the Ottomans having access to the Sinai and Egypt and these ports into the Red Sea, plus, with, plus the capture of Basra, they were really able to contest these waters with the Portuguese for 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 you know, a good 150, 200 years, uh, they had the the ability to basically sustain an Eastern fleet at this time whilst uh, having a strong uh, force to contest the Mediterranean at the same time. It's absolutely, yes. I was just going to say quickly that it's absolutely incredible to me that um, Qatar, which I think is uh, located on that island there, um, is playing this role as this vital, um, um, uh, vitally located um, um, for trade because that, that role has been played on that island for so long because um, um, archaeologists and historians identify it as the site of Dilmun, which is a site talked about even in Sumerian texts where they describe it as a good place and a place of richness because yes. it was um, it was it was in between the Sumerian civilization and the Harappan Indian civilization and the hmm. trade that went on. So for all yep. of that time, it has played that important role, which I think is just absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course, the other great island, which um, is a major strategic importance going a bit further east, is Hormuz, which basically controls mm -hmm. access to the Persian Gulf. And of course, Hormuz was a very early acquisition into the Portuguese Empire. I think it was acquired in around 1507. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this just speaks to the, the rapid advance of the Portuguese and their expansion. But the fact that um, the Ottomans, you know, despite their local proximity, were actually late arrivals. The Portuguese had already established a significant empire in the Indian Ocean, in the Persian Gulf, and in Oman in particular before the Ottomans had even arrived but that's of course um brings us nicely on to the other theater of campaigning for the Ottomans which is the Mediterranean Sea um as you can see on this map um Algeria and parts of Tunisia and Tripoli um modernly northern Libya are part of the Ottoman Empire well previously um these areas have been contested essentially once um Ferdinand uh, of, of Aragon had you know, established his control um, along with Castile over the um, the Nasserid uh, uh, Emirate in Granada. Uh, the next, obviously, protocol was to expand um, Christian domination over North Africa, because, of course, this had been a traditional site for piracy, um, Muslim piracy vis-a-vis -vis the Christians. And um, after, you know, establishing various puppet rulers, um, uh, Order Shreis, and um, who would later become um, known as Barbarossa and the rest, or um, Hayreddin, um, basically facilitated the ouster of one of these puppet kings of um, Ferdinand and took over control of Algeria or Algiers then. And rather than, you know, establish a independent principality in order to essentially, you know, gain a strategic advantage against the Spanish, um, as the, they would obviously had to fight for the independence of their realm, um, Urash Reis uh, submitted himself to the Sultan Selim and later he would be succeeded by his younger brother, uh, Hayreddin Barbarossa, who would later become the Pasha 
of um, the province of Algiers establishing a Ottoman presence from the West. And again, this has been essentially bought as a result of the, um, the Spanish encroachment in the region, this um, traditionally Muslim region. And from the 1520s and 1530s onwards, essentially Barbarossa uh, raids Sicily, he raids Sardinia, raids Corsica, raids you know, throughout you know, most of southern Italy and the eastern coast of Spain. And um, this, of course, Charles V um, becomes the um, the King of Spain in 1516 and the um, Holy Roman Emperor in 1519. Um, did we he mention deals... Otranto in the previous stream? Yes. I can't remember. We, okay, we on, did. On, okay. on several streams. Okay. <laughs> let's, okay, not, let's, not, let's not cover Otranto again. <laughs> well, no, um, good. I, I'm just going to yes. say that the, 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 the Ottomans had been angling this direction and this period really manifests that push into the Mediterranean. That's all I was going to say. Yes, I, I think, uh, t to my mind, um, the defection of um, uh, Hayreddin to the Ottomans really does open up an entire sort of new mm. avenue of, um, of raiding opportunities and um, conquest, which was mm. uh, almost impossible to imagine, you know, e even sort of 50 or 100 years before, even at Otranto. And, um, and, nevertheless... and, Sully and Suleiman has really enhanced the, the naval capabilities of his empire. Like, really, you could say the dockyards of Constantinople have not been busier since, you know, probably the 8th or 9th century. Like, Suleiman has really um, made this a fundamental part of the 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 empire again, or of his empire rather. Yes, um, Charles V essentially responds by employing one Andrea Doria, a Genoese um, admiral. Yes. My um, man, in my man. In order to um, essentially lead a assault against the Ottomans in this region and. Uh, they do quite well. However, in response to this, um, Barbarossa is given, in addition to the position of Pasha of Algiers, uh, he is created Grand Captain of the Navies of the Ottomans. In addition to um, raiding the coasts of um, uh, the Western Mediterranean, um, he is also the chief envoy, uh, the chief conduit between the uh, court in Istanbul and the French, because from you know the 1530s onwards, the French are doing very poorly in the Italian wars. Um, in 1525, Francis had lost decisively at the Battle of Bavia, which we'll cover on a future stream. And from the 1530s onwards, the French, in their rivalry of the Habsburgs, had actually been courting the Ottomans as a means to undermine mind Habsburg power in not only you know um, in Italy and Spain but in, in Europe more broadly and so as part of these um, Ottoman embassies we see as we see on this image on the left these um, composite images by Titian uh, the creation of the so-called Franco-Ottoman alliance which again just speaks to um, what levels the French will go to in order to um, undermine yeah. um, uh, the Catholic supremacy of the Habsburg and this, dynasty. Of course, had, the, um, this had quite a bearing on on men like Doria, because of course um, Genoa sort of swapped in and out of um, French mm. control at this time. Um, the perfidious Doria, Doria, Doria himself, I think, was um, um, I think he he worked for the French at first as a sort of soldier of fortune. Mm. Then he um, fought for an independent Genoa. Um, um, then he went to go and fight for Charles because apparently um, I think Francis wasn't paying him enough. So, I mean, I think that's probably another factor in um, the increased supremacy of the Turks on the sea is uh, um, the, the uppity nature of, I suppose, the Venetians and the Genoans um, you and, know, refusing and, to help the knights at Rhodes. And, what happened. and the Genoese and the Genoese too hadn't forgotten also the activities of the French in the north of Italy, you, you know, uh, 80 years prior. I mean, this was no, sort of singed. Not. This was singed into the psyche of men like Andrea Doria as well. So anyway, um, Charles V is, you know, like I said, is incredibly serious about dealing with the threat to Barbarossa and um, leads two invasions in person, one at Tunis, uh, where he defeats Barbarossa and takes over the city. And the um, Habsburgs actually hold on to Tunis for 40 years from 1535 until 1574. And this, again, is one of the further impetuses towards the Franco-Ottoman alliance. Now, in 1538, we have um, the most decisive victory of um, Barbarossa uh, against um, Andrea Doria at um, the Battle of um, Plevitsa. And I think just to, to, to indicate, I think, uh, you know, what Columba was saying about, you know, the um, the fraught alliances, the Genoese, uh, one of the theories as to why um, Doria performed so badly at the Battle of Plevitsa is that he was essentially in command of um, defending the Venetian outposts in the Aegean Sea. And as a consequence of um, uh, Prevetsa, all of these um, islands um, uh, essentially fell to the Ottomans, and the Ottomans were able to, you know, set up of their eventual conquest of Cyprus. Um, but nevertheless, we see that conflict, you know, already existing when we talked about our, um, our Venice stream between the 
the national interests of Genoa versus the natural interest of Venice, that Doria was reluctant to defend Venice, even you know, at the expense of the Ottomans. Um, so Barbarossa defeats the Genoese and the Holy League at the Battle of Prevezza. And like we also discussed, there is the Hungarian component to this, whereby the Austrians and the um, the Austrians are fighting again to reclaim Hungary. And you know, Budapest switches hands many times, and this precipitates the Ottoman annexation of the region. It's um, worth mentioning that Prevezza also sits in the very same estuary as Actium. It's geographically the same place. Yes, in terms of all these these allusions to um, continuity with Roman history, hmm. um, Charles, uh, in, in, uh, bolstered by his success in Tunis, um, in retaliation for the defeated um, Plevitsa, uh, launches another invasion into Africa and tries to take Algiers. But this essentially operation is abandoned due to poor weather conditions, and Charles makes a hasty getaway without you know dying in the process. So he's able to um, avoid death. Uh, one facet which is quite interesting is um, how Barbarossa. Uh, was courted by Charles V. Um, he was you know, essentially given, you know, title, rank, um, many incentives to switch sides. Even at one point, um, essentially being offered the rank of um, Lord of all of North Africa, uh, where he did effect to the um, to the um, uh, to to the Catholic side. But I think um, just you know, in fairness as to why Barbarossa did this, you know, rather than just pointing this as you know as a sort of some sort of nationalistic affiliation with the Ottomans or some sort of um, Islamic zeal, is the fact that um, Charles could virtually offer him nothing he didn't already have. I mean, he'd basically gained all of these principalities, you know, at Tripoli, um, Tunis, Algeria for himself, and he had aligned himself with the Ottomans in order to retain the independence of his own provinces. Because of course, as Pasha, he retained. A great deal of independence. So I think, um, in terms of the actual uh, sincerity of those remarks, and you know how you know overblown this claim that Barbarossa could have switched sides, I think um, uh, that claim is you know again it's quite uh, difficult to um, uh, substantiate. But um, the sort of final sort of thing to get to, because we talked about um, the Portuguese conflicts, we talked about um, uh, the Hungarian conflicts, is the uh, Italian wars whereby the Ottoman alliance was actually uh, rather immaterial in terms of giving France a decisive advantage. And when we get to um, Lepanto and we, when we get to Malta, um, this is after uh, 1559, the Spanish had basically, the Habsburgs had basically won the Italian wars and kicked France out to the peninsula until really the Napoleonic Wars. And so when we see the Battle of Lepanto, we see that Spain is leading a coalition of many Italian powers, which are under its um, you know, direct or indirect influence, essentially. So we're talking about Venice, we're talking about the Papal States, we're talking about Tuscany, and we're talking about Genoa. So um, the French are unable to really capitalize off this alliance. And at um, during the reign of Henry II, we enter into a, a long period of decline after his death in a jousting accident. and. Um, Again, you can say civil war in France as a result of the um, uh, the wars of religion. So if no one else has anything to say, Semigog, you've been um, very quiet, um, we can move on to uh, Suleiman as the lawgiver. No, nothing from me, just learning. All I'm going to mention very briefly is that Preveza, it can be described as a defeat, but it's sort of hardly a defeat because the Venetians do manage to leave with you know, portions of their fleet and they do put up a rather gallant defense against the um the smaller Ottoman sort of galleys that do set upon them. Meanwhile, and Andrea Doria sails off with his contingent, which is essentially untouched by the battle. It is a setback for the Holy League, but it is not by any means greatly decisive. Yes. And hmm. for Andrea Doria, this was this was by no means the end of I mean he ended his no. life as sort of the Lord of Genoa, um sort of unofficial hmm. Lord of Genoa. Although he refused to um he refused to take on the title of King or Doge. I think he I think he accepted the title of censor with a sort of you know inspired by the I, ancient Romans. I've heard Italians call him the de the Enrico Dandolo of Genoa, which I think is quite fitting in a yeah, way. Yeah, I think that's about right to be honest. Because yeah. he, I mean, he <laughs> continued to he continued to rule and even engage in battles into his seventies. I think even into his eighties. So I can see mm. why people call him that. Except, um, except unlike Enrico Dandolo, he didn't take Constantinople. Correct. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, have... that's quite the that's quite the point on your CV, I suppose. There's one star caveat that has to be accepted. Yes. Yes, and ironically, had he taken Constantinople in the 1550s, he wouldn't have um, ushered in the, the complete decline of Christendom as a result of that. But anyway, um, 
Yes, I think there's one point to mention is that whilst Barbarossa was in the service of the Ottomans, the Ottomans were superlative um, at sea. Having again, you know, started off as a land power, they were able to match that with their uh, naval cap capabilities. Um, however, by the 1540s, uh, Barbarossa um, retires to Istanbul and um, his capacity as captain essentially at the sea is taken up by um, Drogot, which we'll come to later when we talk about Malta. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll get to uh, Suleiman the Magnificent or Suleiman the Lawgiver, as he is known in Turkey. Um, Semigog, has you been um, quite quiet? Is there anything uh, you want to touch on in terms of the uh, cultural and institutional achievements of Suleiman? Only that he, uh, he he enjoyed the massive wealth that had been arranged for him by the conquests of his father, uh, the control uh, not only of the overland um, trading routes uh, to the east, which you guys ha had mentioned, uh, and, and, and as well as the the, the ones uh, at sea, um, and his uh, campaign of building um, was uh, significant. Uh, his expansion, uh, uh, many of uh, the most important figures of the Ottoman elite were uh, Armenians uh, and Greeks. They handled uh, diplomacy with the West. Uh, Myanmar Sinan, if I'm remembering correctly, was originally of uh, Christian origin, a very famous uh, architect. I believe I have that right. But at any point, the, uh, um, at any rate, the general point is that he oversaw uh, a massive um, uh, building program and uh, expansion in terms of uh, you know the brilliance of Istanbul as the seat of of empire, and of course Another, he continued. Um, hmm. I was going to ask you, Sami Agok, because I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'd know something about this. But um, of course, you had things like the uh, is it the Shahnameh, uh, you know, the sort of epic poem of the kings of Persia, and and Persian Persian literature was sort of the height. But it's during Suleiman's period that you begin to see um. Um, Turkish poetry and literature um, become more prominent. Is, is that the case? Uh, well, y y yes, Kinda. but you must. Y yeah, you have to um, um, factor in that the uh, uh, some grammatical structures like the Izafet um, relationship uh, 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 grammar, um, uh, a huge amount of the vocabulary are taken over from the Persian. So you can say that it is Turkish, and indeed it is written with uh, Arabic characters, but there's a huge uh, volume of um, Persian oh, words so, so would you and say conventions. That, um... Because, of course, Persian, I imagine, would have a much larger vocabulary than something like Turkish. So uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and they sucked in an enormous amount of uh, Arabic uh, vocabulary as well. Um, but Absolutely. I guess the main point is that because of their location, you know, the city is still um, glossed as, you know, the bridge between East and West. And it has this, this vast history, which uh, both you and Furious, having much more knowledge of the classical world than I are, uh, are well aware of um it, it's basically he he took it, it was functionally an empire which now included the the muslim dimension solidly having uh captured the caliphate so he was bringing together uh elements of the persian world elements of the uh arab world um the old you know um mamluk possessions uh north africa he got as far as uh the borders of what's now as morocco he ran in of course to a rough country there um he had uh you know uh, vast interactions with the christian world we've already talked about how the yenicheries were made up of christians it's just very important to understand at this point that these were not quote unquote turks you know the the house of osman was uh turkish uh, but we have seen over and over again that they they see it, it appears they must have pursued some policy of um constant breeding towards uh european bloodlines from what we've I seen with the so much a policy Semigog. it's more um they like what they see <laughs> well yes we'll we'll leave that aside as a question that steps outside the bounds of strict <laughs> history um yeah uh, uh verging as it does into psychology but but i i guess what i'm trying to say uh, not very effectively is that you you have to understand this as a multi-ethnic empire and um because of the conquests that had been undertaken by his father uh suleiman was nicely poised uh in a position uh, to bring those various uh elements together but i, I expect am has uh, 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 more to say uh, on this subject. 
Well, thank you, Samuel Gog. Um, just in particular, you talk about um, the importation of Arabic uh, calligraphy. Um, well, of course, this was finessed during the reign of uh, Suleiman. Um, the thumbnail of this um, episode is a tugra or a royal cipher of uh, Suleiman. That's just a part of it. It's a much bigger. Um, uh, these elements, these are parts of the uh, Diwani uh, calligraphy. Diwani literally means from Diwan, means court, um, are elements of, you know, refining the Arab script, essentially. And this um, Diwani calligraphy um, was, you know, very much um, utilized by the Ottomans and they were um, exemplars and utilizing it. Um, but going back to your um, point, Columba, uh, regarding the uh, Book of Kings, uh, by uh, which is again considered one of the um, uh, the great marvels of um, uh, medieval Persian literature by uh, Fedosi, um, uh, there is a Ottoman equivalent to it, which was uh, consciously styled on the Book of Kings, which is the uh, uh, Suleimaname. And um, like we've discussed in our um, stream regarding the, um, the the Habsburgs, especially Maximilian the First, when we talked about um, stories such as uh, uh, Toyadank or um, the White Knight, uh, what we are seeing is there is a, a conscious attempt at myth making in terms of making Suleiman the Magnificent the ideal Ottoman ruler, which all Ottoman rulers should imitate. And so the Sula uh, 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 Suleiman Name is essentially a. Um, uh, an idealized form of the the great years of his reign between um, 1520 see. to 1555 and um, as we can see you know in the earlier sort of uh, period of Mehmed II uh, we see Mehmed II um, actually employing Italian artists from the Renaissance Bellini in particular uh, to capture his, li uh, his likeness but as we can see in these images uh, the Ottomans here are you know, creating these illustrated manuscripts uh, based on Persian miniature painting, which of course is going to be used in the Mughal court as well. And there is a lot of overlap uh, regarding all of these, um, you know, cultural fusions between uh, Persian art styles, um, Persian poetic form, because of course um, uh, that that is ultimately what the um, the, the Book of Kings represents, uh, Arabic calligraphy and um, Turkish language. All of these elements combined together, and as um, uh, Sebigok mentions, of course, this. Um, uh, the Greek facets and the Roman heritage, because there is one particular figure that one can compare Suleiman to, which is Justinian, in the fact that not only does uh, Suleiman and Justinian roughly rule over the same territory, uh, with the exception being uh, Italy, which of course um, Suleiman never conquered, but nevertheless virtually all the other geography corresponds to the region which Justinian ruled. Uh, but Justinian was a great builder. He is responsible for the um, the grand city of uh, Constantinople after the original constructed by Constantine. He's responsible for the reconstruction of the Hagia Sophia after its destruction in the Nika riots. But in addition to that, um, Justinian and Spain, as someone has mentioned in the chat, sorry for me forgetting that um, Justinian did control a tiny percentage of um, southern Spain, uh, modern day Andalusia. Um, but in addition to that, in addition to this um, grand campaign of um, expansion, this um, imitation of the Roman Empire, uh, he is, of course, known as Kanuni or the lawgiver. And of course, in our previous stream, uh, we talked about how this um, epithet was, you know, sort of granted to Mehmed the Conqueror as well, uh, because he had attempted to establish a secular system of law uh, to essentially deal with the various shortcomings of Sharia in terms of everyday governance. Well, yes, because um, Kanun is sort of, um, law that is within the purview of the ruler, whereas sh um, um, Sharia law is unchangeable, right? It's divine, holy writ. Yes, there's an aspect of, I mean, moral absolutism about this as well, uh, because Kanun, I mean, its, it's origin is actually Greek rather than um, uh, Persian yeah, or, or Turkish. It literally comes from canon, and of course, in, you know, the church we have the canon we have what is essentially what is church teaching what is essential of course the idea of canon has come over and of course we apply it to everything we even apply it to fictional universes the idea of canon yeah the idea yeah, there is a there is a set law all of this originating from the word canon but um canon as you mentioned in I islam it's basically a way of um applying i mean it literally means sort of um you know the, the book of law essentially canoni um is a way essentially of getting around um, the very shortcomings of Sharia. It's under the under um, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, he basically forms an intellectual partnership with um, uh, Ebus und Defendi, uh, Abu Sud, who is um, a great uh, uh, Hanafi Mufti. Uh, the Hanafi school being the um, 
the Sunni school, which um, the Ottomans subscribed to. And of course, and that's a sort of that's an honorific, right? Effendi. Yes. It like just it means it means like a gentleman. Yes. Ah. In the way, yes, in the way that Pasha um, is both a title and an honorific in the way that Sir is in the West, essentially. Mm. The Italian equivalent would be Signore. Mm. Yeah. And another interesting point I'd make about Ottoman art, by the way, is of course that it, it depicts life, it depicts men and it depicts animals, which in a lot of Muslim countries, of course, isn't allowed. You have that strict um, iconoclasm. Yes, and this is uh, this should underscore the difference between or differences uh, between the the more conservative is Islam of today, and obviously that of the period, because you don't see as many of these manuscripts where the faces have been scratched away. Though, of course, you know when when uh, for example the prophet is represented, his face will be covered or it will be sort of a a blank place because they they do observe that that concern. My favorite depictions of Muhammad are when he's, his head and his hands are just fire. <laughs> I, quite, I quite like those ones. But, um, yeah, it's, it's another sort of Chad another, vibe. Yeah, but another point I would make about the Persian poetry is that um, you know we see so often you know the the Ottomans taking influences from from the West um, in terms of their architecture. You know, it's 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 um, Byzantine essentially. Um, but but it, but in terms of um, poetry, Persian literature, many have argued that, um, that Persian literature was tran translated into Europe, and it was one of the um, it was a massive influence on poetry and literature. I mean, Suleiman himself. I mean, he's a bit later, but you do see in his writings and in his um, inspiration from the Persians. You know, he has this. Um, incredibly focused romantic literature, you know, that will be devoted to a woman. Um, we see very similar things in the West in terms of, you know, um, chivalric love poems and, you know, Critian yeah, Pro and Provence, all that. Yeah, Provence all poetry or what's his name, uh, a Can, Can Grande della Scala, you know, the Dolce Stil Nuovo troubadours in general. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, someone in the chat is mentioning um, uh, Andalusia had a stricter version of Islamic law. Well, that's complicated. Um, under the um, uh, Halifs of Cordoba, uh, no, that wasn't really the case. The stricter imitation of Islam was brought in under the Moroccan base um, Amomahads, I think, uh, during the last period where the Muslims ruled any sort of significant part of Islam. And that itself is very brief. So we're talking from the the late 11th to the, sorry, the late 12th to early 13th centuries before we see the wholesale loss of territory by about um, 1250. But it's through, and Al-Andalus, it's through Spain that we possibly, as you mentioned, get that first aspect of um, Persianized culture. And we see, again, an exemplification of that under um, under Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, so is there anything else anyone wants to um, to say before we move on? Yes, one thing about uh, revisionism and your mention of the things like the the Suleiman Name, you know, which is you know sort of like the Babur Name or the rest. It's the 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 Persian term. Or the, yes, or the um, the Akbar Name as well. Uh, in mm -hmm. terms of yes, elements like this. We've, we've right. They're 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 Sorry, basically they're basically you know biographies, but they're they verge upon hagiographies um, from the perspective of revisionism. And I thought I would give just uh, one example of that. Um, you know, uh, uh, Selim, um, the Grim, who engages in this conquest, well, you know, somewhat after the fact, he he gets the epithet Yavuz, meaning Grim, because of his treatment of uh, uh, people at various times. We've reviewed some of that. But um, on, in the period of uh, Suleiman, and a little bit later, there was a, a strong revisional, uh, uh, revisionist uh, attempt to um, embody the sort of um, the historical inevitability of uh, his taking of the realm of Islam. Um, there's a, a very great uh, 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 Sufi uh, sheikh um, in the Islamic world called Ibn al-Arabi, and he came actually from Andalusia and ended up traveling to the east and uh, died in uh, Damascus, as I understand it. And it is said, there's a, a particular Ottoman uh, document that was that was used as a uh, to establish this, this uh, sort of revisionist history. And, you know, I had it up here and I, I so I'll save you the ah here it is it's um it's the Al Shajara Al Numania fi Al Dawla Al Uthmania um 
and it's it's a text that is of questionable authenticity um, because of course um, Ibn al Arabi was from the 13th century but uh, this text was uh, put forth as a prophecy by this great sheikh of uh, you know with all his Sufi wisdom that the Ottomans would eventually come and become caliphs and uh, take over the rest of the uh, Muslim world. And, and this was very strongly uh, promoted um, by Suleiman and the court and the rest. And there is in fact a story where apparently this great Sufi thinker and holy man was in Damascus towards the end of his life. And so the story goes, this is of course just a story. Um, he was uh, on the street and this crowd of um, of uh, Muslims led by some venal character who was running a grift went marching by and uh, the story goes that Ibn al-Arabi stepped out and looked at them and said the 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 god you worship is beneath my feet and uh and of course they they attacked him some people claim that the injuries he sustained from being beaten by the mob um led to his death and as the story goes um it, the place where he eventually was buried in Damascus was you know um covered in a trash heap um, or by a trash heap. And so anyway, uh, the, the story goes that Selim the Conqueror went south, and when he passed through Damascus, he he went and uh, cleared away the trash and found the place where Ibn al-Arabi had been buried. And you know, again, it's just a story, but they say that they smashed through the paving stones and looked down there and found out that there was actually gold buried there, su uh, suggesting that the sheik had known that there was a treasure beneath, and he was indicating how they were only interested in money. But what is oh, historical... I see. I like that story. What, That's a good story. Yeah, and the historical fact, however, is that when uh, Selim the Grim, who was not known for being a friendly guy, uh, was passing through Damascus, he did in fact um, build out and improve and make much nicer the tomb of uh, Ibn al-Arabi. Um, and so if anybody knows about Sunni um, Sufism, Ibn al-Arabi is probably the single biggest, greatest figure in it, which is why they call him the great uh, sheikh. Um, so it shows you how um, they knit together a story after the fact, indicating that these major Muslim figures had foreseen uh, their taking of this territory. And they, in fact, um, used the combination of the texts texts and the uh, the rebuilding of the tomb and the rest, so both architectural and literary programs to um, lock themselves in as though this had always been known, you know, since... Well, I mean, don't we, don't we see the exact same thing with the early Caesars? I mean, AM and I, we, we did a stream on the Aeneid, um, you know, and I, I read um, at length <laughs> um, the, the section where, um, um, you know, Aeneas is having his prophecy read, the prophecy about his line, um, you know, ending with Augustus, uh, um, and, and and it's that same idea of sort of well, this was destined to happen. You know, we were always meant to um, be great rulers. Um, it's it's something that's very common, and they did it very well. And to to provide a little segue, you know, of course, the architecture, as you guys know better than I, is basically just imitation of Romanesque. You know, when you say Byzantine, it's basically Roman. Uh, you know, the 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 typical um, look of a, a great mosque of the period from Istanbul, as we can see here in this image, is you know the central dome flanked by these other domes that were put into place as a part of the supporting structure for that central dome. And so, with um with figures like Miamar Sinan, he was struggling his entire life to match and improve uh, upon the accomplishment with the dome of the Hagia Sophia, you know, which had literally been built 1,000 years before. So the Ottomans, even down to their most famous architects, felt the challenge of somehow matching what had been done by, by the Romans uh, and the, the Byzantines that came before them, if indeed there's a distinction there. We won't get into that. Um, and I, I, this this is a good segue, I think, for where uh, AM is probably going to go here at some point, because uh, seeing themselves in some respect as like Justinian, it, it the, the, the natural next step would be to take over Italy and, um, and establish Ottoman power there. Yes, precisely. I mean, uh, architecturally, there is a direct continuation. Really, one of the few innovations um, are the minarets, um, you know, take it or leave it, really. Um, but of course, reiterating this and taking this back to uh, the earlier stream we did, um, the Semigog last week, um, which, of course, is one of the holiest sites in Istanbul for Muslims, is, of course, the um, uh, the Eyob Sultan Mosque, which was built upon the ruins of the demolished um, Church of the Holy Apostles. And, of course, it was um, dedicated 
uh, to Ayyub al Ansari, who again is seen as this um, one of the um, people who died at the uh, the initial uh, Arabic siege of Constantinople in the seventh century, who was then revised and recontextualized as basically the forerunner for the eventual Muslim conquest. So yes, this revisionism, this historical revisionism, really the eventual conquest of Constantinople is baked in, and of course, apparently Muhammad himself, you know, gives that raison d'etre that it is our goal to seize Constantinople and of course build this great empire but just before we get um to um italy and get to malta um i do want to talk about um the influence of roxelana and the issue the, over the 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 warning of uh, uh all of you should always already be aware of redheads <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so just to just to establish um Roxolana, um it, it, she's from a part of you know Ruthenia, which was then part of Poland, which is now a western part of Ukraine. And um it's assumed that she was the daughter of a Orthodox priest. Her Christian name would have been Alexandra or something similar to that, and that she was captured by the uh Crimeas, uh, the Crimeans and sold as a slave to Constantinople. And once she had arrived in in the harem of the uh, Tokape Palace, uh, she was given the nickname uh, uh, Rusalatsi, uh, which basically means, you know, the um, the Russian woman, which later became, you know, rendered as um, Roxolana. So it's essentially a um, a nickname, and of course her um, her regal title was um, uh, Hurum Sultan. But she starts off very early on uh, once she's introduced into the court. I believe she's about um, uh, fourteen when she arrives in the Ottoman court. Um, she establishes is a powerful hold over um, uh, Suleiman, who had already had a, um, a healthy male heir. Um, I, I can't recall the um, the consort, uh, the Valid Sultan, who, who would have been um, uh, Mustafa's mother. Um, uh, is it Mahreddin? Am, is that, am I correct, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know, but I can insert here very neatly that um, she was uh, she occasioned a great deal of um, of deeply romantic and um and, and and abjectly focused poetry on the part of uh of Suleiman. So uh, just going back to that previous theme of the stuff with uh, love poetry and the rest, um Suleiman himself uh, seemed to always be able to find some time to write fawning uh poetry yes, to her. I believe the term my... today the today, term today would be simping, I believe. <laughs> yes, that's we'll, we'll, we'll listen to this. My lonely niche, my wealth, my love, my moonlight, my most sincere friend, confident, and very existence, my sultan, my one and only love. And of course, sultan means, you know, imperator, authority, mm. essentially. Um, the most beautiful among beautiful, my springtime, my merry face love, my daytime, my sweetheart, my laughing leaf, my sweet, my rose, the only one who does not distress me, my Istanbul, my Kalaman, the earth of my Anatolia, my Baghdad and Khorasan, my my woman of the beautiful hair, my love of the slanted brow, my love of the eyes full of misery. I'll sing your praises always. So yes, <laughs> um, there was um, <laughs> extensive and yearning uh, love poetry to again just intimate the the colossal hold. And I think what was scandalous at the time was that, of course, we've talked about um, the traditions of Ottoman courtship, how. Um, invariably the the concubine was a slave often a christian um slave from the balkans or um from ruthenia and invariably they would produce one son and then once that son succeeded will be elevated to the vlid sultan um Hulam sultan actually married um uh Suleiman, I believe in 1533, which was a massive break in departure and bore him um, many sons, uh, Salim, uh, Bayezid, uh, uh, Jihangir, among others. And so in addition, and again, this obviously placed a major strain on the succession because of course there was a healthy and successful um, heir in the form of Mustafa who had already, again, what was the, you know, fundamental sort of aspect of the role of a prince before the eventual sort of fratricidal succession. You could say that in achieving, you know, various uh, gov governorships in, you know, achieving military prowess, um, the currency in order to establish yourself in the eventual war of the, uh, the war of the succession was to establish personal prestige. And Mustafa had very much established that prestige. But of course, now you have a formal, um, uh, uh, 
queen of the Ottomans, uh, Hurem Sultan, um, who is elevated above the, um, the the previous consort, who you know a lot of Western um, uh, chroniclers of the time. Uh, reported as the first wife, and of course there was no marriage uh, between um, uh, Mahreddin and um, Suleiman. And so this leads to an eventual issue over the succession. Um, one of the first victims of this, arguably, it's still debated, but arguably, is um, uh, Ibrahim Pasha, the Grand Vizier and the longtime friend of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, Ibrahim had been uh, Grand Vizier for 13 years by 1536. He'd been placed as governor of um, Syria and Egypt, and in that position, he had given you know vast amounts of um, uh, t taxation revenues to the Ottoman court. He'd been able to run those provinces very effectively, and of course, he reached the height of his prestige during the um, Safavid Wars, which we alluded to earlier. Um, but during that campaign, he made the mistake of um, adopting a Persian epithet because Persian um, uh, terminology, um, you know, uh, titles is titulature is slightly different to the Ottomans. And so he adopted um, the title Sultan, which in the Persian context uh, literally just means one who has authority. But in the Ottoman context, it means universal authority, imparato, universal rule. And so Suleiman takes this as a personal affront. And from this, um, you can say, rift between the two. Um, again, this is arguable because there are still quite a few people who argue for a revisionist side where um, Hurem Sultan wasn't arguing for the um, uh, succession of her son. Uh, Ibrahim Pasha uh, was, of course, advocating for the succession of Mustafa and not of um, Selim. And essentially what happens from this point on, I think it's fair to say, is that Hurem Sultan begins to poison Suleiman's mind against Ibrahim Pasha and devise for um, her own daughter and her um, son-in-law, uh, Rustem Pasha, to take over the position from Ibrahim Pasha. And among other things, there are also um, corruption charges brought against him. So Ibrahim Pasha is strangled on the orders of the Sultan and therefore loses, he, uh, Suleiman loses one of his um, um, most competent officials. And you know, moving on from this, um, now we have to deal with um, Mustafa himself. Um, do either do, do any of you want to talk about the death of um, Mustafa? I'm afraid not. <laughs> I, I, I only really got as far as um, um, Suleiman's exploits in the Indian Ocean. Um, I couldn't tell you much. I'm afraid. Well, okay, sure. Well, um, Mustafa, by you know, he was in his late thirties by the fifteen fifties, and it was expected that he should succeed. And of course, as we saw with the issue with Bayezid, um, Bayezid was ultimately usurped by his son Selim, and um, Selim therefore, you know, led one of the um, the greatest sort of um, expansions of the Ottoman Empire in its history. And um, Suleiman was eyeing his son Mustafa, and um, believed essentially the same thing could happen to him especially as um, Suleiman was now getting to the age, he was now in his 60s, where he couldn't um, personally campaign anymore. And whenever he did, um, it was at a massive detriment to his own health. And so again, there was um, a conspiracy essentially brought up whereby um, Mustafa was supposedly you know, planning to use uh, again as a result of the, the intervention, possible poisonous words of um, Hurum Sultan. Um, Mustafa again came to his father in, this would have been, um, in Iran during the last um, Safavid war that he would prosecute uh, to basically present himself as loyal to Suleiman. And upon entering Suleiman's tent, Mustafa was strangled by the entourage with the with Suleiman watching is the death of his own son. Oh, wow. Uh, and I, I assume this obviously cleared the way for Roxolana's children. Yes, and then you have the next issue, which is again the fratricidal conflict. <laughs> which one which of them is, is it going to be? Which is yeah. which one? Which one of them? Because of course, um, this was um blamed essentially on um I, I believe this was essentially blamed on uh uh, uh, uh Mihanir, which was the the daughter of um uh Roxlana and uh Urustem Sultan. But um, one of the other casualties supposedly was uh, Chihangir who was a friend of Mustafa and supposedly we would have us believe died of guilt, died of grief at the same time. But that, of course, it should be emphasized that Chihangir was always sickly. So he may have died anyway. But nevertheless, after this, um, the the Sultan has destroyed his most able successor. He's already um, murdered his able Grand Vizier. And now he's left with um, two 
very, very much weaker sons by comparison to Mustafa, um, Salim and Bayezid. And over the next um, few years, I think the crucial factor is when um, Hulem Sultan herself dies in 1558. She predeceases Suleiman by um, eight years. And within a year, essentially, the um, two brothers are now fighting uh, a a full-out civil war over the succession of the empire, um, Suleiman decides to decisively intervene on behalf of his elder son, uh, Salim, and Bayezid flees to, again, as we see these echoes throughout history with um, Salim and, um, uh, and Suleiman, uh, as we see Ahmed fleeing to the court of um, uh, the court of Ismail, um, uh, Bayezid flees to the um, uh, Persian court as well. And essentially, the Suleiman funds, uh, uh, gives gives the Persian um, ruler, um, uh, basically oh, buys yes, him the right yeah, yeah. to murder Bayezid, yeah. Very ruthless. You wonder how they can do these things to their own children, but power well, there is remarkable things. Well, there is there are quite a lot of historical comparisons that one can draw in terms of trying to understand this as more than an act of um, pure brutality. Um, one, of course, is the obvious comparison with um, uh, Fausta. Um, and uh, am I right in saying uh, Crispus uh, Furious? Yeah, um, Fausta being the second wife of Constantine the Great and Constantine the Great's first son, which was Crispus, yes. Yes, and there are basically two stories around that. One story is that Fausta um, contrived to have her, um, s uh, her stepson murdered to ensure the succession of one of her sons, you know, perhaps um, uh, uh, Constantine II. Um, and of course, we see that the presence of so many sons of um, Fausta uh, breeds a very tumultuous situation, which is only resolved with the ascension of Julian some 30 years later. Um, but in that situation, one story is, of course, that um, uh, Fausta contrived to have her, um, um, her, uh, her stepson killed. Uh, the other I think far more fanciful idea is that um, Fausta and Crispus were involved in an incestuous love affair. And they were, that's why she was committed to um, Damnatio in memoriae. When in fact, I think um, the more likely option there is that Constantine realized he had been duped into murdering his eldest son and killed Fausta for basically duping him. Unless um, Furious wants to offer like a um, counterpoint to that. No, I think that's more or less right. But what would be sort of, um, what's the sort of the tragic element from it? Well, for Constantine more so than Fausta, but if this was something created from sort of Fausta's sort of own mind and sort of scheming um, ca characteristic, she suffered the consequences for it either which way because Crispus was killed and he was subjected to Domnatio Memore. But there's almost a, a, a case of once Constantine realised what had happened, because I believe he's the Helena... Um, informed him otherwise of of uh, of the the uh, the the falsity of uh, Crispus's non-existent plot. Then his ire turns to Fausta afterwards, and more or less he's he's killed his most uh, skilled and loyal heir. And then he's left with um, the three sons that he's had with Fausta, which is Con uh, Constans, Constantius, and Constantine the Second. Hmm. So that's <laughs> one. Sorry, sorry, Semi, I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll, I was just going to say very briefly, the, the, the result here is uh, very much similar insofar as I understand um, what you guys are talking about. The, the, an, a number of possible heirs to Suleiman who would have been quite capable, it seems, though of course this is you know alternative history, who knows. Uh, but at any rate, the, the one who survived Selim here, he marks the, the beginning of the downhill slide. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the zenith of empire, as other historians have put it, for the Ottomans was uh, Suleiman, um, mm -hmm. predicated in large part on the accomplishments of his father. And with the appearance of Selim, you know, it's a, it's a long downhill slide. And there are some cases where it's, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And there's a, there's a particular dynasty of grand viziers, the Koprulu, who, mm -hmm. um, who managed to um, delay um, the decline for a period, but uh, Selim uh, himself was known for um, not getting involved on the battlefield and uh, and drinking. So all yes. that trouble, all that intrigue by uh, Roxalana mm. um, yielded someone who did not uh, in any Absolutely. way really do much for the empire. 
so that um so what you're describing semagogue is one way of reading us and then there's the other way of reading us which is the other comparison to roman history um to anyone who likes i claudius out there you know what i'm talking about which is um a figure like olivia whereby the purpose of orchestrating all of these um dramatic deaths is yes, to avoid colored in charge so you can when... rule behind that's one aspect of it but the other aspect of it is to avoid civil war eliminating all other contenders for power to avoid the empire falling into yet another fratricidal conflict which had happened even during the reign of um Suleiman the magnificent so you can argue that um in the fact that livia was so intent that tiberius should succeed her yes it was a form of um you know i will rule through tiberius yeah. because tiberius and of course you know she actually fails to ultimately at the end but nevertheless her two aims are achieved in that she is able to prevent um civil war and she's able to establish herself as basically the the mother of the nation i think of um, course said, how does she how does she do that she does it by whispering into augustus's ear that he should have yes. um, agrippa posthumus murdered yeah yes precisely and, among, and, 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 and almost um, all of his other grandsons as well and almost more famously too uh agrippina the younger with um how Britannicus, son of Claudius, was so swiftly taken care of, and then once um, Britannicus was killed, then Claudius became um, the next victim of uh, Agrippina scheming, all for Agrippina herself um, <laughs> being dispatched by the Praetorians at her own son's orders. I mean, this stuff is, uh, has repeated itself very often in history. Yeah, so there's a there's a very distinct Roman heritage in what we're talking about. So either way, if you're if you're going to describe, you know, um, Hurem as having um, benign intentions regarding, um, you know, either trying to rule the empire through her son or trying to avoid civil war or simply trying to, again, contrive the execution of the much more capable Mustafa and thereby allowing the empire to enter this period of decline. Um, it's still up to date. You know, we, we presented all the arguments Arguments, and this sort of gets on to um, what uh, Semigog was alluding to, which is the zenith and the twilight of the Ottoman Empire uh, commencing. It's the end of its um, invincibility, the end of this um, terror which the Ottomans had, you know, um, evoked as a, basically an unstoppable force which is coming to destroy Christendom. Um, the twin battles of Malta, which takes place during the last year of Suleiman's reign, and Lepanto, which takes place during the reign of um, Selim, uh, really really establish where well, you could say the stagnation if not the decline of the Ottoman Empire at least um so just to I'll, I'll just quickly summarize this and um any of you please just intervene and you know elaborate or um uh, contextualize what I'm saying but yeah uh, simply put we have at the beginning of um uh, Suleiman's reign the attack on the island of Rhodes and thereafter Rhodes and the knights were spared as we talked about and Malta was um, given to the knights by Charles V as their next centre of operation. Um, given the strategic significance of Malta in the centre essentially of the Mediterranean as a, a vital conduit between um, Algeria, Tunisia, which had, of course Tunis had fallen to the, um, the Habsburgs at this point, uh, Tripoli, uh, all of these um, places under, uh, under the Rujut were essentially you know, contested um, these places were always uh, switching hands and Malta was a stronghold for the Christians which essentially you know aided continuously in the, um, the forces against um, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent and of course this is why you know he resolved in 1564 to attack um, and besiege and take the city of Malta. Um, during that time uh, one uh, La Valette who would later give his name to the capital of Malta Valletta uh, was the uh, commander of the Knights of Malta with a similar number and similar composition, albeit there were a lot of um, local uh, Maltese militia who were aligned with the um, defenders against the Ottomans. And essentially the conflict came down to control over three um, fundamental fortresses, uh, St. Elmo, St. Angelo and um, St. Michael. Um, mm. Under the forces of uh, Mustafa Pasha, uh, roughly around and uh, Drajut, um, roughly about forty thousand men were dispatched to um, Malta. I think again, this contextualised with Rhodes. This is roughly about half the number of men who were uh, used yeah, to attack so Rhodes. They're learning. Uh, I, I would. Yeah, I was going to say. I think the Turks learn a lesson here that um, sometimes less is more, um, and also there's less fodder and at uh, at Malta. The Ottomans have approximately 6,000 Safai, which are their sort of elite cavalry, 6,000 Janissaries. Um, they have another contingent of about two or 3,000 uh, lesser Safai, uh, which were raised from Anatolia and Rumelia. Um, 
and of course there's a, a a number of corsairs which are under the command of dragut which uh, make their way from north africa which roughly totals to about forty thousand. and on the hospitaler side um you have rather than 700 knights which you had at malta they number they number about 500 at this point um on the i think it's on the 9th of april of 1565 the um the Habsburgs from Sicily managed to dispatch a contingent of 1,200 soldiers, a, sort of a mixed composition of Italian and Spanish. Um, and then there were, I think, 200 Greek adventurers who made their way from the east, um, and approximately three to uh, sorry three to three and a half thousand militia drawn from the Maltese population. So uh, at Rhodes they were able to assemble about 6,700 fighters, and at this battle here at Malta they raised about 6,100. And uh, and compared to Rhodes, even though, like I just described before, that the knights did clear the island, they took in the harvest, they picked all the fruit, cleaned out the orchard, etc. Malta is a much smaller island. There's even less places from which to uh, uh, forage from than on Rhodes. So it was actually important that the Ottomans did not bring too big a force, which is arguably the problem they had at Rhodes. Do you want me to continue? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I'm just mm. listening. Uh, yes, and uh, you mentioned the three, the f three fortifications at Saint Elmo, Saint uh, Michael, and um, oh God, I've just got the third one; it's gone blank. Um, anyway, the the three I'll castles at Malta. Sorry, yes, yeah, Saint Angelo. That's right. Um, and uh, and so what the what the Turks do is they there's actually from the beginning a a, a, a a disagreement with the command between the, the the three men who are leading it as to where to attack first and from the onset from when they land on the island not only are there a, is there a disagreement about the man in which to assault these fortresses but the knights themselves the moment the turks land on the island they're being harassed by the cavalry who basically mount their horses and, and sort of engage with these cavalry skirmishes whenever the turks are trying to move on the island but eventually there's so many Turks there that once they sort of disembark, the knights retreat in the, to these three fortresses. And if you have a if you have a look at the map of Malta from this time, uh, the the, the uh, Saint Michael and Saint Angelo basically form like a, a two points of a trident against like a, diff, a, a an opposite peninsula. They sit perpendicular, and then Saint An uh, Saint Elmo sits at the end of this perpendicular peninsula, and um and overlooking the uh, overlooking the uh, the two main fortresses, sort of the main part of the city, uh, there's um, a mountain range, I, uh, well, not a mountain range, but there's um, what they call the Santa Margarita, which is a big mountain that overlooks um, the two main fortresses at Sant'Angelo and um, uh, St. Michael. And the Turks mount their artillery up there and they're bombarding, bombarding the main part of the city. And even though they make two initial forays into or onto the walls of St. Uh, St. Michael and St. Angelo, they are repelled. And from that point on, I can't remember if it was Ali Pasha but, uh, that was advocating for the attack on St. Elmo, but eventually once the Turks realise they can't take the main portion of, of the city, um, they then move to St. Uh, Elmo, and the fighting in Saint Ant uh, on St. Elmo is savage, absolutely savage. Um, they begin their attacks on, I think, the 20th or 21st of May, um, when uh, when the sappers uh, are trying to undermine the walls in concert with just relentless Turkish artillery, and the the Spanish actually sally out at night and um, and drop like sort of rudimentary explosives on the diggers and all their works and and really set them back and kill an, a large number of these diggers and sappers. But then the Janissaries immediately cotton on to what's happening and they sort of counterattack the Spanish, throw them against the walls, um, and there's casualties on both sides. But these attacks against St. Olmo occur again, again and again. For instance, there's another attack on June the 2nd, um, because this is when Dragut finally arrives with his galleys and whatever. And and what he actually does is he actually sets um, another artillery battery um, opposite the harbour so that no one... Because prior to prior to the um, the 2nd of June, the the Knights of St. John were sort of ferrying supplies and a steady number of reinforcements from the main part of the fortification to St. Elmo. And, um, and Dragut sends, uh, sets up this artillery battery opposite the harbour and they, the, the Maltese can't use um, even their small galleys because they just get shot out of the water. But what the Knights actually do do is they sally from the main fortress. They actually cut down the gunners, um, which Dragut didn't reinforce, but then afterwards the, the the knights can't use the guns so they retreat back into the city and the turks sort of re remand the positions and use the guns again but um 
but sort of ironically, the Mal- the Maltese, the knights have guns in their fortresses of Saint El- uh, of um, Saint Michael and Saint um, and, and Saint Angelo, shooting at the Turkish artillery that is shooting on uh, on the fort of Saint Elmo. But the Turks also are firing from their position on the harbour on Saint Elmo as well. So basically, both sides are inflicting casualties on each on each other with indirect artillery fire. Um, but uh, from the 9th of June, this battle really intensifies and um, the Janissaries actually enter the fray. They manage to break down parts of the Wall of St. Elmo and they begin attacking very, very fier- fiercely. And there's battles from... Um, well, the Janissaries think, are of, quite renowned as sappers as well, right? Exactly, yeah. And they're very unafraid of attacking in the midst of an artillery barrage or sort of f- following in the immediate aftermath of a barrage, which you might sort of consider like a really rudimentary notion of a creeping barrage it's not that but uh, the same lines of attacking in the immediate aftermath of of artillery and there's attacks on the not third of third of june the 9th of june the 10th of june the 15th of june the 16th of june repeatedly hitting these walls and the the commander of saint elmo basically commends the local um, militia with having fought with equal bravery to the knights um, and they keep sending uh, the commander of Saint Elmo keeps sending um, messages to the, the to to the main the, to the commander that's in in um Saint uh, Saint Angelo, but he basically says you must hold your positions. There can be no evacuation from Saint Elmo because even though the Habsburg did send twelve hundred reinforcements from Sicily, they're gathering a relief force on Sicily from the Habsburg holdings in the Mediterranean and. For so long as the Turks are focused on St. Elmo, they're buying time and buying time for the relief army. And eventually, I think it's on the, might be on the 23rd or 22nd, they hold out one last night, one night assault by the Janissaries and they throw them back. But then I think it's the 23rd or the 24th, um, the, they eventually over, uh, overwhelm the defenders of St. Elmo and they're basically killed to a man. I think the Turks, ca- Turks capture like half a dozen knights that are left. So the defense of St. Elmo is extremely stout. But something um, does happen after St. Elmo is captured. The Turks make an attempt, because they're actually starting to suffer sort of shortages again, the, 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 Rod- the Rhodian problem is struck again. So they try and attack Mdina, which is um, the, the, the city on the inside of the island. And there's only about, I think, 20 or 30 defenders in this city. So what they do is, as a bluff, they shoot the city, a couple of city cannons in the direction of the Turkish force sent to attack Medina. Then being shot at by artillery, they think, the Turks think, oh, goodness, this city is actually garrisoned. Let's go back to um, the harbour. So Medina is spared almost any Turkish attack from a mere bluff. And meanwhile, the Turks, once St. Elmo is captured after the, uh, I think, the 20th or 24th of June, they focus every... Do you every- all have um, this horrible episode where the Turks float the Christian bodies across in crucifixes? I actually that don't road? remember that. Yeah, I, I remember I, hearing um, um, the, the commander of the Turks, he makes some mock crucifixes um, and puts the, the dead bodies um, um, after they massacre them and floats them across. And apparently, um, um, Valet, the commander, in response, takes the uh, kills his Turkish prisoners, puts their heads in the cannonballs, and fires them at the Turkish camp. Actually, that's um, right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he gave uh, he gave as good as he got, I suppose. Exactly. And actually, now that you've said, I think it's actually in this last part um, after Saint Elmo's fallen, because um, the Turks send all the artillery back to Santa Margarita, which is what overlooks uh, Castel Sant'Angelo and Castel Saint Saint, Saint Michael San Miguel. And they managed to actually finally, with, with all the artillery in one place, they break down these walls and the, the knights and the militia and the Habsburg troops are sort of fighting for their lives. Um, and the Turks just send repeated assault, repeated assault. I can't remember what actually happened. I think, um, I can't remember what day it was um, in, in the siege, but one of the Turkish captains of like the Janissary Corps, I think, is wounded or, or injured or, or what have you. And so when they're just about to break through um, to uh, like the, the citadel of Fort San Angelo, the Turks immediately break off their assault and they sort of, they spare the, the knights, um, you know, being really pressed against the citadel. But once this attack falters, um, the it's the the Habsburgs finally arrive with the relief force from Sicily. They've disembarked. They um 
they arrive with a with a force of um of of uh, of these troops that they've been gathering in Sicily for two or three months from it's from the crown. 10, 000, I think it's about. it's about ten or twelve thousand, yeah. And so they basically have to call off the siege because they've been so exhausted against throwing themselves against these fortifications, which they did succeed in doing on Rhodes. But if you look at it geographically, Rhodes was very isolated from, from Europe. And this is why, aside from that Venetian contingent from Cyprus, which did reinforce them, they received no help from Europe. But Malta lies, you know, right in the... I don't mean to do this as a meme, but sort of right in the bosom of Sicily, right? It's it's in the centre of the Mediterranean. It's close to Italy. It's not that far from Spain. So this relieving army could arrive. And sort of by the time that the Habsburgs arrive with these reinforcements of, you know, 10,000, 15,000 men or 12,000, the, the Turks are so tired. They're so spent. They break off the siege um, is there not, after um, after several, several months. Is there not also a story of... Um of um a marian apparition of the virgin mary appearing at malta it's yeah i i heard this at school um funnily enough because it, it was a story told by one of the um the uh, like the priests used to teach at my school and it's, it, it involves like the turks penetrating a breach in the wall and one of the cannoneers having like an, an, a, a div, a, an apparition like you say like a divine image and when the janissaries break this part of the wall they have um like a rudimentary equivalent of grape shot and they just blast the Turks out of this out of this um, break in the wall, and then it sends them into retreat, which I think might be part of the story of, of how I said one of the captains dies and they break off the assault. I think it's that period there where they sort of are, are almost getting through to the Citadel of St. Angelo and the Turkish um, assault falters at the last minute. Although some... There are there is a source. I'm trying to think of um, what his name was. There was a an Italian man, uh, Francesco Balbi di Correggio, who actually wrote a journal through the entire siege and survived the siege. Um, also attests to the Turks actually in their one of their barrages. You know, how I sort of said the Janissaries almost, it, you know, attacked in concert with artillery and sort of like a rudimentary yeah. creeping barrage. They were yeah. very unafraid of doing that. In this assault, it appears that the Turks actually friendly fired themselves very badly. And mm. the Janissaries and the artillery sort of got confused with each other and the and the Janissaries got shot from behind by their own artillery and that's what broke the assault. So whether it's the apparition, whether it's the friendly fire, no one really knows. But mm. those stories are accounted for in the journal. Another um, another point I would make, and I, I don't know if you made it because I took a quick break there, but um, if my geography is correct, Malta is located essentially close to Sicily, like you say, but it, it's in between, you know, I mean, Sicily and you know the closest point between Europe and Africa right and so it's a if you have ships stationed in the harbors at Malta you essentially control passage between the eastern and western halves of the Mediterranean so it's a hugely yeah, important strategic point and this would re rear its head again in the second world war obviously very different time frame of you know a whole different kettle of fish but you know it, it is testament to the decisive locality and nature of malta and the fact that malta is easy it, it's re relatively easy to defend it's a very defensible island and with the exception of lampedusa yeah it does sit in that confluence between sicily and africa which is a decisive um passageway for supplies for military expeditions for trade everything exactly well maybe that's why the virgin decided to save it right yeah. now Thank you very much, both of you, for your um, wonderful contributions there. But we have to very quickly um, sum up Lepanto, if that's possible, before everyone falls asleep. <laughs> um, and so needless to say that um, it was a decisive defeat for the Ottomans. Um, so much so, essentially, it brings the westward expansion of the Ottoman Empire to a halt. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a major sort of um, failure in terms of trying to consolidate their possession to, you know, the Mediterranean as a whole. Um, in response to this, uh, Suleiman decides he is going to launch a final campaign and he's going to take Vienna. However, he is now in his 70s and the trip to through Hungary to Vienna kills him. Um, and so the campaign upon Selim succeeding him, again, uncontested because all of his brothers have been murdered, um, the campaign is abandoned. At the same year, um, uh, Saint Pius V becomes Pope and uh, convokes a new formation of the Holy League. And um, Selim 
uh, leads the attack on Cyprus, and Cyprus finally falls in 1571. Crete will hold out for another hundred years, but um, as with Rhodes, Cyprus falls, therefore allowing the Ottomans seemingly again to bounce back after the defeat of Malta. And this leads to the um, decisive engagement at Lepanto. So um, very quickly, um, do you want to sum up the significance of Lepanto? Yeah, so um, as we sort of allu alluded to before, we spoke about uh, Proveso, um, Andrea Doria manages to leave the battle unscathed, and the Venetians, although battered and having fought valiant valiantly, managed to make it back to Venice with their navy, or at least their remnants sort of kind of intact. Um, so Lepanto was sort of fought off the, is it off the coast of, um, not feel, no, where is uh, Lepanto? I know it's off the coast of, the coast of Greece, but it's, Yes, Patras near Patras. Cephalonia. That's right, Cephalonia, that's right. Uh, between that and not enough packed off. Thank you, Semigog. Um, yeah, and uh, essentially the the Holy League um, are slightly unnumbered by the by the um, by the Turks, but the, the what the Holy League does have at its disposal, these sort of really large what you might call like a galleon or galleuses, depending what sort of phraseology you use. And, um and the Christian contingent is lined up with um, uh, Andre Doria is on the right flank with his Genoese conting contingent. Uh, uh, Juan de Austria and Alvaro de Bazan are in the centre with sort of the, the core of the sort of Casti Habsburg uh, fleet. And then on the left, um, Agostino Barbarigo, uh, Barbarigo is on the left flank with the Venetians. So the, the Habsburg have, have wisely stuck themselves between the Genoese and the Venetians, <laughs> which is um, which was smart considering what happened. Oh, oh, sorry, Marcus, just, just to clarify, um, yeah. the Doria at the battle was uh, Giovanni, da Giovanni Andrea Doria. Uh, yes, different Gian Doria. Andrea, yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I made the mail. I yeah. made the mis same mistake earlier. All should also should add that if I remember correctly, the uh, the actually the fleets were mixed. So uh, to some extent, um, the the various participants in the league, uh, their ships were mixed along the line so as to prevent one group pulling out and fleeing. Th that was that was true. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, these uh, what I mentioned was sort of largely, you know, largely is contingent larger venetian con contingent but what semigog said is actually true they did inter intermingle parts of them so that you know like the the genoese of the venetians wouldn't sort of scarper if if the battle got a little too hot um but what uh and, and then opposite uh, with the um with the turks you have Ulush ali on the left on the turkish left you have um um you have the 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 captain ali in the center with the ottoman flagship and then on the far right of the to Ottoman line, you have uh, Mehmet uh, uh, Sirocco um, commanding the like the smaller uh, galleys, like the more sort of inland sea types against the sort of what is the uh, Venetian contingent of a similar nature. And interestingly enough, um, despite there being an initial barrage between the two fleets from their sort of flagships, they're largely ineffective, although the, the Holy League guns are larger of a larger calibre and able to inflict a little bit of damage on the um, on the Turkish fleet. But what sort of more or less happens is that the 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 main Holy League flagships sail forward and almost sail straight through the Turkish lines, and they sink some of their smaller ships. But once they're sort of through, the big uh, the big Holy League ships don't really partake in the battle very much. But um, the the main part of the engagement happens on the Holy League right, which is the sorry the Holy League left, which is the the Ottoman right. And the Venetians, again, find themselves absolutely in the thick of the fighting. And there's instances where two, three, five ships at a time have grappling hooks on each other and a, the boarding parties. And, for instance, I, I think, I can't remember if it's the, the deputy commander or the main commander of the, um, the Venetian flank, um, in fact, is killed in one of these boarding parties. And they... they and there's a huge number of sailor, sailors killed. Yes, in um, Agostino, Agostino Babarcio. Okay, so Agostino does die. Yeah, I think he dies, and I think his his um his uh, second in command also dies because it's very vicious fighting. But the Venetians do get the upper hand on this on their left flank, and meanwhile in the center, the because the Holy League's bigger ships has sunk uh, quite a few of the smaller ships, the Ottoman flagship find itself, finds itself on its own. And so what the Christians do is they take the initiative and actually manage to 
uh, form themselves around, I think it's like a cluster of, say, the Turkish flagship and maybe two or three support vessels, and they're literally sort of set upon by a half a dozen of the Holy League ships, and they board them, and after a vicious fight in hand-to-hand combat with the grappling hooks and with, you know, handheld Aki buses and whatever, they actually um kill, they, they board the Ottoman flagship, they kill the Ottoman captain, and after this contest in the centre peters out, the Ottoman um, left and the centre reserve try to break out of the battle um, and po- and pass uh, where Dor- Doria is with the Genoese contingent. And um, there's Doria, Doria's contingent is scattered, although not sunk. But um, the Holy League attempt to steer from the centre and from their left where they have actually defeated the Ottoman contingents and try to sail southwards. But what's left of the Ottoman Navy breaks off. Um, they set up a screen to defend themselves so that they can escape. But the Ottoman Reserve beelines its way off the off the battlefield because they have just seen their almost entirety of their naval sunk navy sunk. And between the artillery advantage of the of the Holy League with their big galleasses, and having um, despite the bitter fighting with the Venetians, they lost on on their right flank. The the Turks realized that the the Ottomans realized that the day's lost. And so, um, the better part of their of their navy, which is if if you look at the the casualty ratings, right? There's approximately sixty thousand sailors in the in the Holy League and eighty four thousand sailors in the Ottoman force. The Holy League loses between seven to ten thousand sort of wounded and killed. Meanwhile, the Ottoman losses are as high as thirty thousand. And sailors probably take more training than what tr- land troops do. Um, and also, you have a combination of loss of, you know, what you'd consider marines, you know, um, ocean. Well, it's worse. Well, it's worse than that, Marcus. Not only do you have, them. not only do you have the massive loss of life, and what's essentially an infantry battle fought on um, yeah. <laughs> pontoons, essentially, as you can see with this um, massive galleas battle. But in yeah. addition to that, many of the Ottoman troops, um, many of the Ottoman marines, were press ganged as Christian slaves, so right. they lost tens of thousands of Christian slaves during the battle as well, mm. which were taken over mm. by the Catholic side. So it yeah. was a utterly debilitating defeat. And it's hard to imagine that as many as, you know, nearly 40,000 people could die during a naval battle. But this, again, truly mm. displays the horror of the 16th century Gallias battle. But nevertheless, oh, yeah. you know, also, it, was, um, it was truly savage. The battle was also, I mean, a, a massive sort of propaganda coup for the Catholic yes, powers in Europe. Brilliant. Right? I mean, well, well, more than that. I mean, um, it was consecrated as a feast day in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, Our Lady of Victory was um, created by um, Pius V to commemorate the battle. As you can see on this um, picture, this is a contemporary allegory of the victory at Lepanto by Vasari. Uh, again, we mentioned on our stream regarding the the origins of the term uh, the Rinascimento or the Renaissance. Um, this, um, yeah, and of you course, can we see, see that um, death is with the Turks, and then yes, victory exactly. is sort of crowning the and Christians. We, yeah. And we can see similar imagery with Malta. Uh, what this is probably far more so than an actual strategic victory is a moral victory for Christendom. I would say it essentially um, renders I, the idea that the Ottomans are in any way invincible or superlative on land or at sea is completely undone by the combination of these battles. And as a result of that, you can almost say the um, the Ottoman threat is reduced to just another power in the Mediterranean as a result of these two battles. Yes, Nevertheless, I mean, I think well, just... didn't, um, didn't Elizabeth I write about it? And she said, you know, God only knows what's going to happen if we lose, essentially. Yes, Elizabeth I, <laughs> Elizabeth the First had a very um, interesting relationship with the uh, Turkish Sultan. Uh, she was she to say that she was unambiguously on the side of the um, the Catholics would be a bit of a, of a bit a bit of a misnomer, especially as she tries to um, <laughs> call me shocked. <laughs> especially as she tries to court the favor of um, Mehmed the Third later on. So um, she has an interesting it, relationship, so to speak. But but can does, I add? Does, a... does yeah, Sorry, sure. Go see go me. Go see me. Just a few things that must be said about the battle because it was such a such a a, a shot in the arm for the West. Um, one of them is that this, this marked a point at which um, Western military innovation uh, begins to move into the lead again. And yes. so, with these uh, galleasses, uh, they had higher decks. They were much larger ships, and uh, as many of you probably know, though it didn't get mentioned, they um they did not have the cannons just oriented forward at the front of the ship with a couple at the back. 
Um, instead, they had uh, they were set up for broadside. Some of the depictions show the cannons being below the level of the oarsmen, but many of them were certainly above the level of the oarsmen. And so what happened with these six massive galleasses that were positioned ahead of the rest of the, uh, the fleet, as you can see in the image on the right, was that they... Well, there's a famous quote by a Marine uh, general, an American uh, Marine uh, general, Chesty Puller, and his, his quote was where an officer came to him and he said, oh my God, we're entirely surrounded. And Chesty Puller responded saying, they've got us right where we want them. We can now shoot in every direction. And <laughs> and so as nice those... Chesty <laughs> As so these uh, larger uh, ships that were innovations, they literally, it was very, very difficult to board them, if not impossible, because the decks were so much higher than all the rest of the other ships. And it, it's, it's, there's also no way. Thicker, which would mean that they were impervious to all but the largest guns of which the Ottoman had few on their vessels. And the right, reason I these... suppose why they had such high decks is because they weren't for boarding and fighting in the, tra the traditional method because they had the cannons. Mm. And the, the, those cannons, uh, you know, as they moved forward and engaged first, uh, as they passed through or had the other ships cluster around them, they could fire on all sides. And in one of the accounts that I came across, um, they actually fired their front guns before they engaged. They rotated and fired a broadside, rotated again, fired from the rear, rotated again, fired another broadside. And so they were able to send um, concentrated fire into the, 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 the line of the Ottoman ships at a much higher volume than otherwise would have been possible. So that was a decisive thing. It's worth taking a look at because it yeah. marks the point at which the, um, the West sort of moves into the advance again in terms of uh, tactical, uh, you know, technical innovations and the rest. Another point that uh, should be brought up that I just want to throw in here because I'm talking to a group of uh, Catholics. Um, as the um, fleets were uh, coming together, the the Catholic forces, um, they were all, you know, blasphemy was going to be punished by death, they indicated with the fleet. Everyone was praying the rosary. Um, and uh, they had, you know, a, a, an image of the Virgin of uh, Guadalupe or whatever um, sent from the New World, one of the copies of it. And uh, apparently Don Juan, as he was approaching the fleet, there was a favorable shift of wind for the Catholics. So as the ships were moving forward to engage with the Turks, he, he is said to have uh, danced in thanks to God on the deck of his ship as they were closing for, uh, for the fight. There are two Based. other points. One is that, yeah, very based, man. Never trust a man who can't dance. Um, <laughs> and and so as the 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 um the the groups were set up, there were three that um Furious laid out for us. Uh, the fourth contingent, though, apparently uh, uh, Don Juan was um was uh, a bright guy and uh, realized that once they closed, it would be very very difficult indeed. Uh, to to make sense of what was going on from his flagship. So apparently they placed the reserve force in the rear in the hands of the most experienced of all the admirals they had. And his intervention later when one of the flanks, I can't remember uh, which side it was on, um, began to crumble. It was his intervention that uh, saved the day with the uh, the Ottomans trying to move around the line and come at it from uh, more than one side. I believe yeah, it was along. It's, it's when they, it's, it was when the um, they pressed the Venetians on the Holy League left. That's what on the, the, the reserve force close was. Yeah. Closest yeah. to the coast, right? Yeah, yeah. So a portion of the center went to relieve them, and then a portion of the reserve went to relieve them, and that's what tipped the the scales in favor of the um the Venetian contingent prevailing against the Ottomans, which sort of destroyed the the Ottoman right flank. And then the last thing that I think definitely deserves mention is uh, that they, I, I'm not sure, depending on the account you come across, they'll tell you that it happened at different times, and I suspect that some of that has to do with their. The, the person relating its desire to have the maximum dramatic effect. But the um, the the Christians uh, at the oars um, who were slaves were, uh, or excuse me, the slaves of whatever sort they were at the oars when they closed, um, at some point they were freed um, by the Christians and they came up on decks to assist in the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which was much like the, um, what was uh, Furious, what was that Roman battle where they used the Corvus and they basically turned it into an inch infantry That was fight. in the Punic oh, War, was, the second yeah, it was, it was War. Economus, yeah, the, the Carthaginian, uh, the Carthaginian naval battles of the first Punic War, yeah, and most famously in Economus, which is off the coast of Sicily as well. 
Right. So they, they essentially, they turned it intentionally into an infantry battle in a number of respects and they, they freed their crews. But uh, you know, in those moments when I'm permitted to just sort of think about it and think about the obvious Mm. things that uh, might've happened, uh, one wonders if when passing the Turkish ships or at the moment of boarding them, um, some of these Christian um, ships might've had people on them who could shout to the Ottoman Mm. ships that if the slaves rose up and joined, um, then, then they would be freed. Um, I, I tend to uh, imagine they might have said that. I, I agree. Doubtless, that was a part of the uh, part of the equation. Um, one thing I, I will add briefly, actually, two very small things. Just because semigogs use the phraseology "a shot in the arm," uh, it's worth noting that um, one Mig- Miguel. Um, Miguel de Cervantes was actually a participant in the battle. I think someone in the chat might have mentioned it. And um, he actually ironically lost his arm in the battle because he was on board the ship uh, Marquesa, um, which was one of the um, larger ships under, you know, Don Juan of, of Austria uh, um, and uh, and survived the battle. And obviously Cervantes went to become, you know, one of the great sort of navigators <laughs> I of history. that's why he turned to writing, yeah. It, exactly. That's also um, why he, he he turned to it in such a way that he mocked mocked it resent, uh, relentlessly all the romances of his period exactly and another thing worth mentioning qu- uh, quickly just because semigog did raise the, the the galley slaves of the christians ali pasha um is, is, is sort of no one really knows whether this was in fact proclaimed or not but he allegedly is, is said said to have um uh, implored his his you know galley roles to say and he by saying if i win this battle i promise you liberty if the day is yours, then God has given it to you. Whereas inversely, um, you know, John of Austria laconically um, <laughs> mentioned to the entire fleet that um, there is no paradise for cowards. <laughs> so you've got two very different approaches of inspiration from the opposite you gotta, commanders. you got to love the fact that he's mocking cowards and dancing on the ship. Yes. So, I mean, yes. that's that's pretty damn based. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like such a chat. <laughs> yes. Just the uh, uh, Chad Yes meme for Don, uh, Don John of Austria. And there's one other thing. Wasn't he like something like 24? I mean, he's crazy young at this point and just kicking ass and taking names. I, I seem to remember he's yeah. in his mid-20s. But anyway, yeah, last he, he, point. He, him, and, him and Cervantes have like a combined age of under 50, I think, in, in the, battle, the Battle of Lepanto. Well, there we oh. have it. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, yes, unless anyone has any sort of um, sum- summarizing remarks to make about the um, the reign of Suleiman, uh, we can move on quickly to the super chats. Just, uh, I would just say, I, I was just going to say that you know, with uh, with with Malta, um, with uh, with the business of uh, Lepanto, you had the, uh, the, the the Ottomans were were never the same again. I mean, despite the fact that it's been argued, and you you guys kind of touched on it, that Lepanto wasn't that great a um, a, a strategic victory in a, the long term, or, or people have tried to make that argument. But the um, the reality is that they the Ottomans never again tried to move into the Western Mediterranean. And uh, I mean, that's, a that's moral, an, sometimes a moral victory can be a strategic one. I mean, we see that with. Um, you know the battles of Marathon. You know during the Persian War, and and and, and um, you know that sort of crushing defeat. I mean, it's not as if the Persians couldn't have raised another army and attacked again, um, but we see them just sort of being broken by these victories, and they don't they don't really attempt it again. Also, um, also, it's, th- there's a case to be made as well for strategic inertia. I think in some ways Malta and Lepanto can be almost considered. Without the complete annihilation that was associated with um, the Tetrita Bogovald, you know the, the the Romans being humbled by Arminius in the Black Forest, but the Roman defeat in the Black Forest prevents the Roman conquest of Germania, in the same way that the the Battle of uh, Lepanto and the siege of Malta and the Turks being kicked out of Otranto um, prevent. Ottoman expansion into you know Europe into southern and eventually Western Europe. Um, inversely, again, without the anni- the annihilation aspect of it, in some ways it almost encompasses an Adrianople in that you have this shifting of power from one empire to another, one group of people to another. Um, sort of, yeah, I sort of see Lepanto La- and Malta as being sort of a Turkish equivalence of, and probably along with the siege of Vienna as well, as being these Ottoman equivalents of, say, Adrianople and uh, the the Tutor Bergewald. I, I sort of, I see those um, comparisons there. 
And there are two two other little points to add. Um, the the Ottomans did not uh, assay uh, conquest of the western reaches of of uh, the Mediterranean again, um, but they did take uh, Cyprus right around this time as well. And I, I wanted to mention that just because um, I, we had been talking before, and I mentioned that uh, in, in the previous stream that Mehmet the Conqueror had offered to allow the uh, the the people to leave from Istanbul or to be secure in their property, and Apostolic Majesty had quite r rightly pointed out that that doesn't always happen. Um, we did yeah. just see that it, it, it happened in with the, the Knights of Rhodes and stuff, but uh, at Famagusta in Cyprus, it certainly didn't, where they promised uh, safe passage to the, to the garrison there, and they ended up uh, torturing and uh, skinning alive the mm -hmm. uh, commander there and sending the stuffed mm -hmm. skin back home uh, attached mm -hmm. to a mast. Um, oh, but, the, but the Charming. But the, the the important thing here is that while it was uh, it was a, a massive victory, and I'm not so much of a Turcophile that I would uh, that I wouldn't um, celebrate Lepanto. Certainly, it's just ultimately stylish. Um, but but they did take Cyprus at that point, and so they secured for quite some time their control of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and it, you, of course, all of you know this, but our listeners should understand that the Ottomans were only. Um, were only able to be as much of a threat as they were in this period because of the fighting within Christendom. Um, and, and indeed you'll see that the Ottoman empire itself, um, is sort of handed additional free time on a platter by the West because of, uh, the 30 years war. And, and so once the 30 years war is pretty much wrapped up, um, we see the close of this sort of phase that begins here with with this where the ottomans are not moving into the 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 western uh parts of the mediterranean or further into europe but they're not getting pushed out either and they manage to keep any number of their possessions in the east because of the infighting that's going on within christendom and yeah, then we and see quite that. quickly as it's as just the last part as they as they um as the Christians finally settle their own infighting to whatever extent they finally do, that's when the tides very swiftly turn. So I think to a historical eye, looking at it with some distance in time, it's pretty clear from this period, uh, you know, from the death of Suleiman up until, I guess, the second siege of Vienna, which I, I want to say that's 1683, yes. um, roughly a, a hundred years. I think it's fair to say that vis-a-vis -vis their possessions in Europe, the Ottomans are on borrowed time that's given to them simply because we were so busy fighting ourselves. Yes, there's something as a qualifier I'd like to add to that. I, I don't mean to um, undermine the significance of Malta and Lepanto, but um, I'm going to argue that this happened in every single direction. So we've explained when it, came, when it comes to Persia that the ultimate goal of Suleiman the Magnificent was to remove the main uh, uh, Shiite opposition. However, he failed to do so and had to conclude the Peace of Masia, which established the ultimate boundaries of Safavid, Iran, and the Ottoman Empire. Essentially, the whole idea of a religious conquest to unify Islam had been abandoned 10 years before Malta. When we look at the Hungarian situation, after Mohash, despite the decisive victory in breaking the unitary and independent nature of Hungary, um, what it really establishes is the consolidation of what would later become the Habsburg monarchy. The Habsburg monarchy encompassing Hungary, encompassing Bohemia, encompassing Austria is forged in the fires against the Ottomans. And again, this is the Ottomans have some success in the 1540s, but ultimately no decisive uh, success where they're able to take Vienna and move onwards into the Holy Roman Empire. Likewise, in the Mediterranean theater, which is the other principal theater, uh, the Ottomans are checked at Lepanto and they are checked at Malta. And as we've seen, they were also checked by the Portuguese into the Indian Ocean at the same time. And ultimately the Indian influence in that region will be replaced by the British influence, and of course the Dutch influence before then. So what I would argue is that um, Suleiman the Magnificent inherited a very favorable position and inherited a very weak and divided opposition, Hungary of course being the best example. And what we see during the course of um, Suleiman's reign is that in every single direction he is now facing stronger opposition and all avenues for advancement have been checked so much so that as um, Semigog says the Ottomans are going to hold on to their territory due to the infighting of these various powers but ultimately when they're able to put up a united front such as at 1683 the results are completely disastrous and result in the Ottoman Empire losing a significant amount of territory. 
also it's sorry, Chris. Do you want to go, Sammy? I was just going to say from that point forward, we all started eating croissants. <laughs> um, what what I was going to add is there's something peculiar as well about the the Turkish, uh, like the Ottoman Empire, at this point in time, is. And many of you who listen have heard me sort of say this um, several times over these very streams we've done across many different examples and and, um, and the subject matter might change. But again, history doesn't very infrequently repeats itself, but it very often rhymes. And it's amazing that, you know, from the very early origins um, around Sogut um, and the very early Osman, Osman sort of Beylik, this sort of within a century becomes this you know ottoman empire um that there's, there's this enormous energy to them that they sort of expand in rapid directions and they sort of overcome almost every force that's arrayed against them this is has a strange um similarity to the arab expansion from the sixth century and i mean the circumstances are entirely different in, in that context you've got like exhausted persians and romans and the arabs exploit that but again with great energy great courage um, with um, you know enormous um, you know bravery and and under great hardship they expand and create this massive realm in a very short space of time and the Turks do the same thing. But what actually happens is there's sort of they reach a point of extension where they sort of hit a limit, and then this period of sort of stagnation and decline sets in. And it's really after Suleiman's reign this starts to happen to the Ottoman Empire as did happen to the Arabs from about the 9th century, 10th century onwards. Is, is a, a repeat of that same problem. In fairness, in fairness, in fairness to the Ottomans though, the Ottomans may suffer stagnation, limitation and they are no longer the world conquering power that they were say for example in the early 16th mm -hmm. century. Nevertheless, the Ottomans do not suffer the same political collapse that the um, uh, the Arabs went through in very Correct. quick succession. They don't, they, the, they don't fragment during the Abbasid Caliphate. And mm. so what we see is that despite all odds, despite um, the disaster at the Great Turkish War, the Ottomans are able to hold on to their territory throughout the entire 18th century with um, only sort of minor deductions, such as the loss of Crimea. And it's only in the latter half of the 19th century. This is where we're talking, you know, um, 300 years after Lepanto, did the Ottoman Empire really start losing vast amounts of territory in Europe? So um, yeah, yes, indeed, uh, I, I agree with that take. That's, that's that is that is. So yes, but we we really have to move on though because um, yeah. it is over three hours and ten minutes. It might be our <laughs> longest stream ever. Um, it, it's amazing, you know. We we do um, we do a shorter time period, and yet we manage to um, to always overrun now. Anyway, uh, salad fork for five Canadian dollars. Thank you very much. One wonders at the state of mind of a man who knows that if he does not seize power and murder his own brothers, that they will do it to him. Grim. Yes, that that is the ultimate consequence of um, power in um, the medieval and renaissance world ultimately that you have to kill all your opponents before they kill you especially when it becomes an institution as of the ottoman system but of course they do move beyond it and um what um uh Hulem sultan really represents is you can say this um shift in the succession from fratricidal you know murdering all your brothers towards what will later be established in the ottoman empire which is basically keeping all the princes locked up into the harem until they could be released at a certain point and then it's it's not the it's not the eldest son or even the son who kills all the others it is the oldest um member of the house of osman who takes over and that is the the basis of which we see the, even the modern claimants use um their claim to succession Anyway, John Boy for, oh, sorry, uh, Polish ambassador. Uh, I don't know what um, the Polish currency is, um, uh, sorry to say, but thank you nevertheless. Um, Janissaries, imagine trying to recreate the worst idea of the Roman Empire, Praetorians. Ottomans sadly couldn't learn from um, my estate Apostoliski uh, podcasts. Well, um, thank you for that, um, uh, Polish <laughs> ambassador. Uh, yes, it does. Um, well, in fairness, in the first couple of centuries, it did seem like quite a, quite a good idea. And there wasn't the sort of raison d'etre where it would inevitably lead into what it later became in the, um, certainly in the seven. 17th and 18th centuries, which were um, kingmakers and um, sultan assassinators. Um, John Boy for 10 euros. Um, the map of the Ottoman Empire 1520 is more or less the ancient Bronze Age empires of Hittites, Egypt, Levant, Mycenaeans, etc. That's quite a revelation how history layers itself indeed. 
Um, John Boy again for 10 euros. Thank you very much. Um, another 10 quid to say fascinating stream. A and brilliant as ever, and particularly nice to see Columba back. Uh, thanks to Semi and Furious too. Well, thank you very much, John Boy, and thanks, thank you buddy. to my wonderful guests. Um, John Gordon for $10. Uh, did the Sultan's Christian concubines influence the Sultan's interactions between him and his Christian subjects? Perhaps they could have lobbied for more autonomy for the Demimi. Um, that's a complicated question. Um, it should be noted that two of the most powerful women in Ottoman history, uh, Hurem Sultan, uh, uh, Sultan and uh, Khoshem Sultan, uh, who dominates the um, uh, Ottoman Empire during the earlier half of the 16th century, both of them were uh, children of Ottoman of uh, Orthodox priests, yet I would say neither made any significant overture towards favouring the Christian subjects over any of the other subjects within the empire. I mean, looking at um, Harum Sultan in particular, um, she modelled herself consciously on um, uh, Zubaida, who was the consort of um, Harun al-Rashid, the, um, mm. the the famous ruler of the um, Abbasid Caliphate of um, the one thousand um, uh, the one thousand knights fame. Um, you know, she was famed for you know building various bathhouses and hospitals, uh, but not churches. As as we were explaining in our last stream, the Ottoman Empire uh, basically imprisoned the Orthodox Church in the Balkans, and would casually begin demolishing all the you know the, the most sacred churches or converting them into mosques, i.e., the Hagia Sophia or the Church of the Holy Apostles, um, and the construction of churches was almost impossible. Um, regarding uh, Koshem Sultan, I don't know enough about her to be able to um, to answer that, I'm afraid. Well, f just as a, a quick point, I think um, it's fair to say that the, the patriarch in Constantinople had to relocate, I think, to three or four separate churches in the city in the first 150 years of his existence. Yes. It, was in the, um, it was in the Church of the Holy Apostles, and then it went to the uh, Pamakaristos Church, and then that got converted to a mosque. So uh, the, the patriarch was moving around in the city for, the for run, much of his early yeah. life. Yes. Yeah, and Aya Irene became an arsenal. And uh, yeah. Hagia Sophia became a mosque, you know. I Correct, mean, yeah. Th there it is. Mm. You would have thought, though, wouldn't you, that there might be some sort of interest in um, favouring one particular party or another, but um, that, that clearly wasn't the case with the um, the two daughters of the Orthodox priests. Um, anyway, I think that is a good place to leave our discussion for today. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Does anyone have anything they want to shill? Um, I'll let the other gentleman go first. Well, I have uh, a stream that is coming up this week, and it will be with one uh, American Krogan. I believe that will be at uh, 4 p.m., and it will uh, be basically an overview of what's going on in the world of video games. You know, there are many people who look at things, uh, you know, in movies and in television or in the media in general, the culture wars and their various manifestations. Uh, American Krogan is interesting in so far as he looks closely at video games, um, and he's done so as regards specific games uh, on his channel. He's also looked uh, at history a bit. Um, but in this case, I'm going to have him on, and hopefully he will tell us all about, you know, a Describe for us a general picture of what's going on out there in terms of video games as a do domain for uh, shaping the narrative or what you might also call uh, subversion. Well, that sounds interesting. I mean, I saw people were sharing um, clips from the new um, um, the new Call of Duty, which is apparently just, you know, sort of um, like that film in Glorious Bastards. It's just a sort of revenge fantasy, I suppose. Yeah, over the top. Yeah. Mm. Yes, th th that's bound to be a, a, a watch. So for those who are interested, definitely don't miss it, because if you haven't come across Krogan's work, uh, yes, it's, it's worth delving into for sure. And, of course, uh, who better to be on them with uh, Mr. Semigog? So mm -hmm. tune in, guys. Yes, and just um, another thank you to Semigog and um, imploring yeah. anyone here to go and um, check out his channel and maybe consider subscribing yes. to him. He's a wonderful yes, content creator. you must. It's it's been um, fun. It's been fun being the pasta posse plus one semigog. Please, uh, by all means, join us again sometime. <laughs> Anytime, Jets. Thank you very much, uh, Columba. Um, any um anyone who who remembers, I did that um biography of Clovis for um that Man's World magazine. Um, I've been asked to contribute again an article on 
Richard the Third, which I'm currently working on, um, just going over his life, um, his role in the broader um, historical development of England, um, um, possibly going into the you know the controversy around the princes, which has been you know exhaustively covered over literally centuries. Um, so yeah, that that should be fun. I, I'd encourage anyone to check out the magazine anyway. There's always some some interesting and sometimes very funny stuff. So um, yeah, but apart from that, nothing much. Marcus, uh, nothing new from my end. Um, I suppose I'll just be back on with you guys next week. Uh, my schedules are pretty clear, so nothing to shill. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the continuation of our journey with these streams. So until next week, everyone. Yes, and next week we'll be covering uh, the Russian Tsars, the first Russian Tsars, and in particular we'll be covering Ivan the Terrible, so um, do tune in for that one. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to all of my um, patrons over on Subscribestar. If you have any interest in patronising the channel, please do check out the link in the description. Otherwise, please like the video, uh, leave a comment, and subscribe. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you to my wonderful guests, and good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.